Hello, beautiful people. I am Oliver Perrin for Semiagog, joined today by Mr. Anteos, uh, our uh, Teutonic researcher who will uh, be carrying uh, forward our, our series on light in darkness. This is uh, this is uh, one on the the Paris Commune and the role of the the Masons in all of this. Hang on just a second. I've got my voice going in the background, and I cannot figure out why. I thought I closed all of these and hopefully it has good God. I'm still hearing myself <laughs> a boomer moment. Let me just identify which one of these, there we are gone. Apologies. So we will be taking a look at the, uh, the, what Anteos has dubbed and he assures us that it is no exaggeration. Uh, the Masonic commune of Paris. This is in the, uh, the, the last third of the 19th century, some upheaval um, in, uh, in Paris, in France, uh, directly on the heels of one of these Franco-Prussian wars. I'm sure we'll get into some of the uh, further details uh, momentarily, but this is a part of an ongoing series. It's called Light in Darkness, wherein Anteos and I, uh, more recently, Anteos much more so than I, uh, carrying the full weight of this, uh, we've been looking at secret societies and secret services and uh, a sort of hidden hand of uh, such organizations in all sorts of uh, cultural developments. We've uh, tracked it from uh, the Florentine um, Renaissance in Italy, uh, starting in the last uh, half or quarter or so, let's say the last third of the 15th century. Uh, and we've looked at all sorts of things uh, from there to uh, the Illuminati and the Rosicrucians and uh, the French Revolution. And uh, now Anteus will be walking us through uh, the Paris Commune. And we hope in future perhaps to even take a look at a couple of uh, further historical periods. I've been doing uh, some research myself on all of that. So I'm going to turn it over to Anteos here in just a moment once I get through uh, reviewing the links and doing the uh, the shilling for the channel. Please do follow Semiagog uh, as well as A Safer Space, which is an old uh, sister channel that you can still find on YouTube. Uh, once when I was under a ban hammer for YouTube, uh, my friend Tim and I were posting content there for a while. You can find uh, both channels on YouTube as well as on BitChute. Um, much of this content uh, is over on Odyssey. I encourage all of you to follow me there. Uh, also follow me on Twitter, on Telegram, uh, on Gab, and that sort of thing. I know that you can follow uh, Anteos. Uh, over on Twitter. He also has an Odyssey channel of his own. I really uh, hope that you guys will go and follow him in both those places. He's been doing a whole lot of work on this series. Uh, and at very least, bes besides, you know, um, edumificating all of you, uh, it would be great if, uh, if you followed him on those social media platforms. So there'd be something in it for him as well beyond uh, selfless educational work. So uh, the last thing I need to do is show my two books. There's uh, Cinders from the Bloomery of Youth, a poetry book. Um, you can find that on Amazon uh, under my name, uh, Oliver Perrin, not uh, Semiagog. There's also my sci-fi novella set in a dystopian future. It's called Vinculum. You can find it on Amazon as well. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, I want to thank all the Praetorian chads who make this possible, the channel supporters. I went and tried to re-render um, my latest video with the channel supporters and the full intro animation. <clears throat> and I'm still on my older computer. And I discovered, um, as I should have realized beforehand, that uh, that latest version was created with the latest version of my uh, video software. And on my older computer, I can't even install it to open it and re-render it. So apologies on that. Uh, I very much appreciate all the support on the channel. Uh, we're beginning to get it going again. And uh, yeah, let's jump directly to that. I've been long-winded enough. Anteos, thank you very, very much for um, preparing all the material. I know you've been researching this at length for this uh, latest episode. Um, 
if you have anything you want to uh, to shill, please do so, and maybe uh, give our viewers a sense of uh, what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, Sammy Gog, thanks a lot for having me on for the sixth episode of Light and Darkness, where we delve into secret societies and their uh, uh, influence on Western history. Uh, as regards shilling, I think you already did a pretty good job here. Um, I would just say very briefly a few things about myself. Um, as you can figure out from the accent, I'm a German. Um, I graduated uh, from history. I uh, studied quite a bit, um, but I left university because I realized it is not a place that encourages free, critical, uh, not to say politically incorrect thinking. And so I left. And I'm very happy that um, there are people on the internet who are so well read as you, Sammy Gok, who are willing to make the show. Um, and uh, with that being said, um, I'm ready to go. And what is the subject of our discussion today? Oh, good. Um, the subject is the Paris Commune, um, a very short-lived revolution in the 19th century um, from the 18th of March to the 28th of May, 1871. Um, a social revolutionary movement that took over this, uh, the government of Paris for a very, very brief period. Um, and something which is not well known, it was definitely not known to me before I researched it, is that Freemasons played a predominant role. I mean, in the last show, um, in the last two shows, we covered the Illuminati. There were a lot of Freemasons. The Illuminati infiltrated the Freemasons. We covered the French Revolution. Um, we looked at the Lodge Neuf, sir, in particular. And everybody who is in, uh, interested in Freemasons, I encourage you to go check out these old episodes. They are very instructive. But this show tonight will set a record of Freemasonic involvement in a revolutionary movement. Um, we will see right at the beginning that they are all over the place in this revolution. Um, and uh, I think let's start by sharing the screen. Um, yeah, I'll do that in just one second. Let me quickly just review the 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 really basic background. What what I understand of it uh, for um, this 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 whole commune, as you said, it was uh, 1871. That sounds right. I have not uh, looked into it lately. Um, it uh, basically there was a whole bunch of dissatisfaction, as I understand it, because uh, when the Germans and uh, I should say the Prussians and a number of German allies. Uh, went to war with France. They made very, very short work of them, um, embarrassingly so for the French. And they laid siege to uh, Paris very quickly. And um, the Parisians were armed, the National Guard and the rest, because of these circumstances. And then some sort of uh, armistice or a peace or, or surrender or something, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know the details, was, uh, was arranged. And if I'm not mistaken, many of the French people in uh, Paris and elsewhere were very upset about those terms. They thought that they were um, uh, degrading and uh, they, they wanted to keep fighting, I think, some of them. Um, and uh, a whole bunch of uh, communist or proto-communist, you know, early leftist, socialist, communist agitators um, wanted to take this opportunity when people were suffering from the effects of the war to agitate and uh, take over um, and implement their socialist programs. You know, things like uh, women having the same social status as men, um, you know, egalitarianism and these sorts of things. It didn't last very long, something like 60 or 70 days. Um, and uh, they, they seized Paris and controlled it for uh, some time. And the French uh, prepared uh, a, a very large army um, to come and take back the city. And they did so uh, rather 
dramatically and in uh, and in bloody fashion. Uh, they dealt with uh, with the communards, and this is the period from which we get the uh, expression "to the barricades" because they barricaded a number of streets. Um, and I believe it was following this period that they changed the uh, the layout of the streets in Paris to have these wide boulevards that made it much harder for people to barricade themselves in different parts of the city. Also, much of the city was destroyed. So that that's what little I know uh, by way of background. And now, uh, thanks for your patience, Anteo. So I'll go ahead and um, and bring up your uh, screen so you can get us started. All right, let us begin with the end of the Paris Commune, the 28th of May, 1871. The painting that you see are the last communards. It was the last standoff between the army, between the Republican army and the revolutionaries. And they were shot at the cemetery of Père Lachaise. Um, this wall is called the Mur des Fédérés, the wall of the Federates. And it has a very important, it is a very important symbol in socialist memory, but not only in socialist memory, in Freemasonic memory as well. The image that you see here are Freemasons in France that gather, that gather each year on the 1st of May to commemorate the Paris Commune. You right now you see Pierre uh, Lambiki, who was the Grand Master of the Grand Orient. The Grand Orient is the uh, Grand Lodge of France, and here he delivers a discourse right in front of the wall of the Federates to honor the heroes of the Paris Commune. Um, just uh, very briefly on the last uh, episode on the French Revolution of 1789. Here we have the Grand Master of the Grand Orient um, during the time of the French Revolution. Louis Philippe, the Duke of Orleans, who was an ardent revolutionary, who financed the French Revolution, who was a member of the Jacobin Club, who voted to put his cousin, the king, to death because he was a member of the royal house and i think this shows very neatly the revolutionary uh, con uh, continuity in french freemasonry which is really different from what you see in germany really different from what you see in england and from the us i mean in the us the freemasons carried out one revolution but then that was that. In France and in the Roman countries, Italy, South America, it is really, really different. You have to think about Freemasons in those countries as a much more political movement. All right. Um, another thing which is very, very striking is this image. Uh, it is also from the cemetery Père Lachaise. Um, and you see um, a Freemason holding a banner which says le temps de cherries the time of cherries um, this is an allusion to the song of the same name by jean baptiste clement and they stand right next to his tombstone um, this song was uh, written before the paris commune uh, and it was a very uh, it, it was very popular, but um, during the commune, it got associated with the revolution, with the Paris commune, because the time of cherries, it is, of course, red. That is the flag of socialism, of communism. It is also an allusion to the uh, Semaine Sanglante, to the Bloody Week, in which the um, commune was uh, struck down. And... Uh, they commemorate um, the author of this song. And in fact, in many French lodges, this song is still sung today, not with the meaning of uh, a romance of uh, uh, two people coming together, but in co commemoration of the Paris Commune. 
um, a little bit on the methodology that we use today. How are we going to determine whether somebody is a Freemason or not? Um, because this show is not supposed to be Alex Jones style uh, <laughs> uh, spitting conspiracy theories, but we want to base everything in facts. Um, for this reason, Semigog, I believe you already put a bibliography with all the uh, sources. Uh, thus far, we have had uh, the uh, thorough bibliographies for each episode that you have provided. Um, so far, ah, did it finally come in? Yes. Uh, no, <laughs> no, it didn't. It just indicates that uh, this episode is live. So it's uh, the one that you uh, recently sent me apparently is lost in the uh, momentarily is lost in uh, cyberspace. But as soon as it arrives, uh, it will be plugged in. Uh, anyone who's not watching this live later should be able to just scroll down and see it there as we will uh, insert it. Uh, and you will have uh, references for all of this, as indeed uh, you have them provided by Anteos for all previous episodes. All righty. So our first um, source, uh, our secondary source, is going to be Marc de Jod, Universal Dictionary of Freemasonry, written in French. Um, it's from 2011. It is a dictionary on Freemasonry. Um, so this is how I'm going to establish whether somebody is a Freemason or not. Marc de Jod himself is a Freemason and a professor. Um, I'm just going to give you a quote of him on the Paris Commune. The participation of Parisian Freemasons to the insurrection and to the Paris Commune rests inscribed in history as the most conspicuous mark of Masonic action in French history. Let that sink in. Um, alrighty. And the second bibliography, uh, the second dictionary I refer to is uh, Le Maitre. Um It is, uh, um, as of today, you can access it uh, for free uh, in the internet. Um, and it is a, a dictionary, a biblio... biblio <laughs> biographical dictionary uh, on uh, socialists. And it is it is written by socialist historians. So um, I assume that both uh, Marc de Jod and uh, Le Matron, they are not interested in um, uh, creating conspiracy theories. So I think we can be very safe to um, assign Freemasonship to the actors that we're going to encounter now. Um, uh, also, I have to say as a warning, um, the first half of this uh, episode will be focused on the time before the Paris Commune, um, because we have to talk about a lot of things, how Freemasonry developed, what uh, Freemasonry's um, connection was to the First International, to the workers' movement during the Second Empire, in order to really understand what is going on. Because uh, during the Paris Commune, it's just so many things explode that have been uh, building up uh, decades before. Um, just very, very briefly on the French history, um, Napoleon uh, becomes emperor after the French Revolution. He loses out, uh, he loses to the um, European coalition and in the uh, Congress of Vienna, the Bourbon monarchy is restored. So the old kings are put back on the throne. You see here Louis XVIII and Charles X, younger brothers of Louis XVI, who was uh, executed during the French Revolution. Um, Charles X um, has a rather harsh regiment. He wants to uh, restore um, the Ancien Regime, uh, feudalism, aristocracy. In 1830, um, the Liberals get almost 50% of the seats in Parliament. Um, he clamps down, he abolishes the freedom of the press, and he wants to dissolve the Parliament. And what do the French do in this situation, Semigog? Uh... I don't know what what do they do um a revolution um yeah they have it <laughs> the 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 answer for everything in france apparently <laughs> yeah. 
It is. Uh, the painting is by uh, Jeanne de la Croix. Um, Liberty guiding the people. Um, I, I very often I see this painting associated with the uh, French Revolution of 1789. This is not the case. We're talking 1830 here. Um, the revolutionaries force the king to abdicate. And there is a new king, um, Louis Philippe. Um, Louis Philippe is the son of Louis Philippe, the Duke of Orléans. That guy, which uh, voted to put his cousin, the former king, to death. Um, so he comes uh, from a how to how should I say it a rather revolutionary household. Um, Louis Philippe is from the House of Orléans. Uh, the House of Orléans is a, a branch of the uh, House of Bourbon. So the House of Bourbon, these are those two guys. And the House of Orléans is a cadet branch. Um, he is more liberal than his uh, cousins from the House of Bourbon. But still, his um, style of government is not liberal enough. Also, there is census suffrage, which leads to conservative majorities in parliament. And Semigog, what do the French do in those situations? Uh, a, 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 more revolution? Indeed. <laughs> there is another revolution. Um the February Revolution that spreads to other European countries. Um, in other European countries, it is not that successful, but in France, it overturns um, the state, the government. Um, and I, I think we can already see um, a pattern here. The, the, the pattern is this. Um, there is a government and the Paris intellectuals don't like it. And they overthrow the government by force. You know, this is the curse of France. France is so centralized. If you want to create a new state, all you need to do is carry out a violent revolution in Paris and that's it. You cannot do that in the Holy Roman Empire. It is a confederacy. You cannot really do it in the US. Um, it is too decentralized, but in France, you can do it just like that. You can pull it off. Yeah, part of that certainly comes from uh, all of the efforts of the Sun King, Louis XIV, to centralize things there uh, and to keep the uh, nobility in line. Um, and, uh, of course, that was uh, not the end of it. The French Revolution itself was a massive exercise in uh, dominance of rural areas and centralization of power, as anyone who is, uh, for example, Breton or uh, from the Vendée can tell you. Um, and it classically goes with that old observation made, I believe it's uh, in The Prince by Machiavelli, about how... Uh, it's very, very difficult to take control in many countries uh, if they're centralized. But once you do, it's very, very neat. And he used the example of the Turks, where the Grand Turk, of course, has the central control. And he said that it was much more difficult in Europe. But of course, that was in his day. And uh, he, he, the, the example of France had not, you know, reached that uh, degree of centralization. Though it seems here that uh, as often as the uh, the French had their revolutions, um, perhaps it's uh, not so hard to seize that centralized control after all. That is very true. Uh, I read the same line in Machiavelli and he made the case that it's very tough to conquer uh, the Ottoman Empire because it's so centralized. But it's very easy to take on the Holy Roman Empire but once you are there, oh boy, that's a tough job. It's a tough job to put all those uh, disparate uh, duchies, uh, principalities together. Yeah, something um, yes. Bismarck could probably tell us all about, you know, having gone, having gone through it. But yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, we, we're going to get to Bismarck. Um, so there is a new government. Mm. This government is very short-lived. I mean, they declare uh, the Second Republic, 
this republic lives for only four years. And there is a provisional government that you see right here. This government lasts for a couple of months only. Sammy Gorg, I've been asking you so many questions already. Oh, there's another good one. What do you think? How many of those ministers are Freemasons? Well, let me look to see how paused they all appear. Let's make this bigger. Hmm. Well, all of the ones in the back who appear to be whispering to each other would have to be Freemasons. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the the one looking uh, off stage, so to speak, would have to be because he's taking cues from a secret handler wearing a, an eyes wide shut outfit. You mean um, this guy? E yeah, I'm just, I'm of course half joking. Uh, but to be safe, I should probably say every single one. Uh, almost, almost. Um, so let's ask, let's ask Marc de Jod, our Freemasonic professor. Tada, only one isn't a Freemason. They are all Freemasons, except for Alphonse de Lamartin, who sits at the left. Um, we also have uh, one Jew among them right in the middle. This is uh, Adolphe Crémieux, who will play a very important role later. Uh, he is uh, Minister of Justice at the moment. Later, during the Commune, he will also be Minister of Justice, but on the side of the French Republic against the Commune. Um, as uh, Minister of Justice in 1870, he will give citizenship to all the Sephardic Jews in Algeria. Um, but this Masonic government is very short-lived. Um, oh, no, no. F first, um, yeah, let's talk a little more about how Masonic this government is. Um, on the 6th of March, 1848, the Grand Orient, so the Grand Lodge of France, sends a deputation to the provisional government to compliment them on their successful revolution. Um, this delegation is received by uh, Alf uh, Adolphe Crémieux. Um, in his Masonic habit. This is as obvious as it gets. Um, so what does this provisional government do in the short time that it has? Um, they um, uh, choose a new national an anthem, the Song of the Girondists, the Song of the Girondists, it was written by Alexandre Dumas. Uh, you know Alexandre Dumas from the Count of Monte Cristo, the Three Musketeers. Uh, he wasn't a Freemason, but he just uh, made this uh, song. And then they adopt this song as national anthem. I'm just going to translate some parts from the chorus. Frère, pour une cause sainte, uh, brothers, for a saint cause. Um, Du créateur de la nature, uh, by the creator of nature. And then the last part, nous mourons pour la liberté. We die for liberty. So this is also very, very obvious. Uh, brothers, frères, this is the Masonic brother. Uh, du créateur de la nature, this is the deist God. Why don't they just say, by God the creator? No, they say by the creator of nature. We know this from the last episode. This is the deist God. This is not the Christian God. Uh, nous mourons pour la liberté. We die for liberty. Um, and here we are. We die for liberty. Um, the motto of the new state is Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité. The same motto of the revolution of 1789. And this is also the motto of the Grand Orient. The Grand Lodge of France. What a coincidence. The government introduces universal male suffrage. So one man, one vote, no matter how high or low your income. Uh, liberty of the press um, and liberty of association, of course. Um, 
then a constitutional assembly is elected um, and they call for a presidential election. Ah, oh boy, they should have gone Robespierre. They should have just installed a dictator to take care of those backward peasants. Ah, those Freemasons. Okay, so what happens? Um, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte happens. This is the nephew of Napoleon the I. Um, I mean, of course, you see he's doing the hidden hand gesture, but um, at this moment, doing my research, I've seen so many disparate, pe disparate people doing this hidden hand gesture, like monarchists, conservatives, Freemasons, socialists. Uh, it was maybe just a thing, like people are doing like this kawaii. <laughs> I, I don't know. Did, at this moment, it means nothing to me anymore, because Napoleon is doing it, his nephew is doing it, and... Uh, the Louis Napoleon is going to have a hard time with the Freemasons. All righty. Um, so, so at this point, we can say that the, that the, the 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 use of the hand gesture is so widespread that it's impossible to take it as any kind of a clear indicator. Yes, you, you see everybody doing it. Um, and then Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, he runs for president. Um, and he receives, would you believe, 75% of the total vote. 75%. That is a crushing defeat to the Freemasons. He immediately purges the government from Freemasons. In his government, there is not one Freemason. Um, let's have a look at the votes. Um, you see those red uh, parts in the west and in the uh, in, in the Brittany. southwest and in the southeast. These are the leftist pa leftist parts of France. Here um, uh, he gets uh, only twenty percent of the vote. Very very. Uh, little votes. And also we see here Paris in the middle. He and Napoleon only gets 50%. It is still very high uh, margin for Paris, but it's much lower than the, uh, than the average. The average is 75. Um, but he doesn't stay president for too long. Um, he makes a coup d'etat, um, or rather a referendum. And what does he do? So Napoleon uh, tours the country. He tells everybody, hey, I'm going to bring order. I'm going to make France strong. Uh, we're going to have colonies and everything. And the French, the peasants, they are like, great, great idea. Um, and actually, the National Assembly, they want to get rid of universal suffrage because they see the masses can be easily swayed by a conservative figure like Napoleon. Um, and Napoleon says, oh, no, 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 no. I am going to make sure that we are going to have universal suffrage. Can you believe that? A monarch who fights against the elite to make sure that you have universal suffrage. Um, in order to seize, uh, I mean, it, it fits entirely with all the uh, elite theory that is being pushed to the fore uh, at the moment by people like Academic Agent, because, you know, the point is that democracy is constantly a cover for, uh, for you know, seize, uh, oligarchs seizing power. Now, in this case, if someone, you know, has some other further claim, um, you know, perhaps, you know, uh, to, to a monarchy. It makes them no less uh, an oligarch, I'd I'd say, and and it raises the questions of a uh, question of who was behind such figures. But once again, I've derailed the the discussion. Please go on. Yeah, um, the the more I look into those revolutions, um, elite theory makes absolute sense to me. You cannot possibly come up with. Oh boy, the French Revolution. Oh, this was so democratic. Oh, this was the French people rising up. Not at all. On the contrary, if you look at the French Revolution, it was a bunch of intellectual liberals getting together, making a revolution. 
And what was the reaction? The countryside didn't like it. Oh, you don't like it? Okay, we're going to crush you. Uh, we're going to uh, destroy your cities. We're going to mass execute you. This is the democracy of the revolutionaries of the French Revolution, um, of uh, all the French revolutions I've yet um, looked at. Um, and one one quick question for you: You might not know this. If anybody, if you don't, and if anybody in the uh, the chat does uh, know, um, I know that the uh, under the revolutionary governments um, earlier that the Vendée was absolutely abused and crushed and smashed and um, murdered, um, but Brittany uh, seems as though it was never really any friend of centralized state control. Um, you know, with their own uh, ethnic identity and all the rest, their own language um, and genetic connections across the uh, across the water. Um, I wonder why it was that a Brittany seemed to vote so strongly for the left, according to your map. Do you know? Or if you don't, does anybody in the, the chat know? Uh, I found it striking. I didn't look into it, um, but I'd love to hear from the chat uh, why that might be the case. Perhaps, perhaps we'll learn. Well, please go on. Okay, so on the 21st of November, 1852, uh, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, this is his uh, civil name, um, he makes a referendum and a huge turnout, 80% uh, of the voters, uh, uh, of the inscribed voters cast their vote. 97% uh, vote yes. I mean, uh, I don't really know um, how much um, this was uh, a rigged game, but um, still, um, we can definitely say, I mean, he got 75% in those elections. Probably they've rigged this election a little bit, but it is still, um, you cannot deny that there was uh, a very, that, that he won this by a very large margin. Um, all righty. Um, so what does... Napoleon III, as he is called now, do to uh, ensure his rule. The first thing you need to do is you need to control Freemasonry. This was the great mistake of Louis XVI, that he didn't understand that he has to control this thing. Um, I mean, if we just look at his cousin, Louis Philippe, the Duke of Orléans, um, he became Grand Master of the Grand Orient. And he had to ask permission of his cousin, the king, because as a prince of the blood, you have to ask, if you want to go abroad, if you want to do anything, you have to ask permission. This is how the Ancien Regime works. And uh, Louis XVI said, oh, why not uh, become Grand Master of French Freemasonry? I don't care. Well, you should have cared because he used it to make a revolution against you. But, I mean, Napoleon uh, isn't that stupid. Um, I mean, he just uh, saw Freemasons carry out a revolution. So he knows quite well what he is up against. Um, and uh, he makes sure that the Freemasonry is put under control. So first of all, what is the situation of Freemasonry at this moment? They are uh, around... 22,000 Freemasons in the whole of France at that time. And there are two grand lodges. There is the Grand Orient of France, and there is the Supreme Conseil, the Supreme Council. These are the two grand lodges. Um, so what does uh, Napoleon III do? First of all, once he becomes president, the Freemasons tell him, hey, would you want to become our Grand Master? And he says, uh, you know, this is really a good idea, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of busy, you know? And he puts a relative. Uh, he uh, has them uh, elect a relative of his. Um, but this is at the beginning. We are looking at the moment now at the last Grand Master before the Paris Commune. This is uh, Emile Meillinet. Uh, he is a French general, loyal to Napoleon III, uh, and he makes sure that um, 
the Freemasons don't discuss politics or religion and lodges. If a lodge is too radical, it is uh, kicked out of the Grand Orient and then it turns into a loge sauvage, into a wild lodge, which is not um, accepted by Freemasonry, by regular Freemasonry. Um, and in this case, when they are a wild lodge, their means are kind of restricted what they can do. Um, so that is the situation. Um, and uh, about the Supreme Council of France, who is the Grand Master? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, the, the, they don't have a Grand Master. Um, they have a Grand Commander. And who is the Grand Commander? The Grand Commander is Adolf Crémieux. Adolf Crémieux, we remember him as being one of the ministers of the provisional government. He is a Freemason and a Jew. Uh, the only Jew, as far as I know, of this provisional government. And he becomes um, Grand Commander of this Grand Lodge. This is the second largest uh, Grand Lodge in France. It has around 6,000 members. It practices the Scottish Rite. It has 33 degrees. You see here, Ordo ab Cao, Order from Chaos. And here you have 33. So they have high degrees. And do we know if the distinction between these two lodges, the first and the second, and the the um the the second is that uh is that uh, does that parallel the division uh between york right and scottish right um i'm not sure whether york right has uh, anything to do with the grand orient of france the york right how many degrees do they have semigog i i do not know but i would guess uh 33 as well i mean mm. that seems to go with the years of uh christ's life but i am no uh, specialist in masonry. Well, let's come at it another direction. Um, do you know what the major difference was between these two lodges? Well, the, the, the first difference is that the Grand Orient is much bigger. Uh, it practices the uh, French right. Um, I think they have seven degrees. Of course, both share the three blue degrees. The um, apprentice... Uh, Oh boy, what's it called in English? Master, apprentice. Uh, you need to help me here. <laughs> I, I wish I knew, but I'm very, very weak with the uh, with the Masonic material. So. I, I only know it in German. Lehrling, Geselle, Meister. Um, well, anyways, three basic degrees. And then on top, the Grand Orient of France, I think at this moment, they have like four high degrees on top. But the Supreme Council, they have 30 degrees on top. Um, and uh, Adolf Cremieux is, of course, a 33rd degree Supreme Council Mason. Um, he is not only Grand Commander of the Supreme Council, he is also President of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, the Universal uh, Israel Alliance. This is something like the ADL of uh, France in the 19th century. <laughs> yes. Lovely. Lovely. As I mentioned, he, as a minister of justice in 1870, grants citizenship to around 40,000 Sephardic Jews in Algeria. So um, something that um, is not very pertinent to what we're talking about today, but I will just mention it very briefly here, is the financial situation in France. Um, at this moment, I would say the richest family in France by far are the Rothschilds. Um, they have an enormously rich banking house. They are also um, building railways. Um, they also make a lot of money from that. Um, it is the Rothschilds who procure most of the loans to the French government. Um, so the government really depends on them. Um, and just to give you an idea of their wealth at that time, I'm going to share you uh, an image of the Chateau de Ferrières. 
This is the mansion of the Rothschilds. It was built in the 1850s. You see it is a huge complex. So nobody else in France at that time was able to just build something like that. Um, it is, uh, yeah, the, you call the style of these buildings the Gou, Ro, Ro, <laughs> the Gou Rothschild, the Rothschild taste. This is a term in um, uh, history of art to describe these kind of mansions. Um, Semigog, let's have a look at the interior. Um, would that be a place where you would like to, I don't know, um, have a dinner with your friends? I can imagine. How does your new home look like? Does it look like this? If uh, no, uh, no, I'm on a, a slab. I have no such grand uh, parquet floor, nor you know, gilded uh, fittings and uh, trim and things. No, but I could, uh, I could flamenco my ass off across that uh, parquet floor. That'd be lovely. Yes, grand. You, you know, I've, I've just thrown this in here because I think it is very important to always see who is the richest person in a country at a given time. Um, before the French Revolution, it was this guy, Louis Philippe. Um, and now these are the Rothschilds. So once uh, the wealth shifts, the, all, all kinds of other things are in contact with that. So uh, if we go back, for instance, to the um, Florentine Renaissance, where you had uh, Cosimo de' Medici, who financed all those um, Renaissance men, like uh, Marsilio Ficino, who translated the uh, Platonic Corpus. Um, you, you always have to look where the money is, what the money is doing. But um, I don't really think they were involved in any shape or form in the Paris Commune. That would have been a very bad investment, <laughs> I think. Yeah, you would imagine that they would be a that they would be canny and uh, cunning enough to see that that likely wasn't going to go anywhere, and it would also alienate the middle classes, uh, you know, the the bourgeoisie of uh, of uh, of Paris. Um, but I, I'm glad that you brought up the point about uh, who was the richest person and what they funded uh, back in the day, because you know we saw when we were looking at the uh, Florentine programs, you know, under under the Medicis, that they very much did seize upon uh, elite status and patronage of the arts as a way to further their program. That was like that was like Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post in its day, because they, to some extent, controlled the intellectuals, and they certainly controlled the available uh, mediums of expression and the themes that were represented thereby, and all the rest. And so it it dovetails rather nicely when you talk about the uh, Rothschild um, style as expressed, because it would have set the standard. And indeed, we saw certain ways that that was used by uh, the Sun King. As I've talked about in the past, my friend Tim told me about it, you know, it's very likely that his pushing of fashion was a way to uh, shape tastes and attitudes to um, to keep the various nobles in Paris where he could watch them. They'd have to come to see what the tastes were, after all. And when they did so, they wouldn't be plotting rebellion out in the provinces. And he could keep an eye on them um, in grand ballrooms like the one you showed uh, in your photo, though, of course, that's from from later you know so definitely the control over um artistic expression uh is a central theme to everything that we've been looking at um so far or most of it you know we didn't i don't i don't know that we saw it uh strongly with the uh the illuminati for for example but um we certainly saw with the rosicrucians they're you know moving quickly to uh to instrumentalize the printing houses and the copper plate engravings and these new mediums of expression. So yeah, a consistent theme across the spread here. And finally, how did Napoleon III control the way people thought? Very important. Uh, we're going to talk about the Falou law. This is from 1850. It is still from the, it was passed during the, Second Republic, so before the establishment of the Second Empire. But I mean, it is still in effect in the Second Empire. That's why I mention it here. Um, it was uh, this law was brought in by uh, Alfred de Falou, 
Uh, he was Minister of Culture under Napoleon when he was still president. Um, and what does this law do? It makes Catholicism an integral part of school curricula. And it also stipulates that any primary school can be run by priests or by monasteries. That is an excellent move. Again, we are talking about a top-down approach. We're talking about elites shaping the culture. And we will see how extremely efficient this is because this way um, the priests can put their propaganda in the brain of the kids just as the SJWs put their propaganda in brains of the kids as we see it today with um, transitioning and all the rest of it. And we have seen that the 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 priests, so to speak, of the secular French state or the uh, Usart Noir, you know, they, the 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 black robed secular um, staff charged with uh, teaching the children, which you know was a a, a central theme of uh, secular France, certainly through much of the uh, of the nineteenth um, and twentieth centuries, or at least the late nineteenth and uh, through uh, much of the twentieth century. And now that the schools are under control, uh, you also need to control the writers, uh, the literally the literary elite. Um, so, uh, I mean, most of this works just very fine by itself. I'm going to give you a few examples. They're really striking. They are actually they are very striking if you look at the um, intellectual elites today. The intellectual elites are almost all progressive. The intellectual elites of the Second Empire are almost all conservative. This is very good for Napoleon III. So one example is uh, Charles Le Comte de Lille. Um, I doubt many have heard of him. I haven't, but he was a big thing at the time. Um, he participated very briefly in the revolution of 1800. 48. Uh, he delivered a speech somewhere and uh, the mob almost killed him. So lesson learned. <laughs> right. Helped him get his mind right. What we have here is failure to communicate. Yes. <laughs> yes. And now listen very closely to this. I'm going to give you a quote. It is gold. What a dirty and despicable rebel humanity is. How stupid the people are. They are an eternal race of slaves who cannot live without a yoke. It is not for them that we will lead our struggle, but for our own ideal. Let them die a miserable death of hunger and cold. This gullible people always prone to massacre their friends. Oh boy, he is pissed. Yeah, and I'm sure that some percentage of our viewers are... are reciting based to themselves. But yes, <laughs> I take no position. I take no position. You know, uh, Charles Le Comte de Lille is not an exception. Let's have a look at uh, Edmond de Goncourt um, and the Salon of uh, Mathilde Bonaparte. So Mathilde Bonaparte is a cousin of Napoleon III who runs a very influential Salon in uh, Paris. Um, and this is just how you have to go about it. You have to um, have a conduit to the uh, intellectual elites because Louis XIV, yeah, very cool. He had his nobles because in his time, the nobles were calling the shots. But um, two, generation, uh, four gener uh, two generations later, under Louis XVI, things had shifted. Right, you had the bourgeoisie, you had an intellectual class in Paris rising up. And Louis the, the 16th and his wife, they were still in uh, Versailles with his nobles. Everything was fine. Oh, everything was great, blah, blah, blah. And they, 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 they didn't realize what was brewing in Paris. Just give, I'm going to give you one example. We're going to step back. This is the great thing about these shows. Every time we see something, we can go back and see uh, and, and, and compare it. So this is Madame Helvetius and her husband, Claude Helvetius. Uh, you remember the salon, which this 
cat lady ran if you want to know why she was a cat lady like uh, in the simpsons but with more money go check out the last episode all right so this salon gathered the intellectual elite of france and out of this salon grew the lodge neuf sir nine sisters this lodge which was so important in the french revolution this lodge had as members ben franklin voltaire Emmanuel Joseph Sies, Camille Desmoulins, Jean Stanton, just to name a few of them, the people that made the revolution. You don't want this to happen. So, very good take of Mathilde Bonaparte to have the salon um, and uh, bring those intellectuals in dependency towards her. Um, and on the right side, you see Edmond de Goncourt, He frequented this salon. Uh, we still know him. Uh, we still know Edmond de Goncourt because he created the Prix de Goncourt, the uh, the Prize of Goncourt. This is the mo um, this is the most prestigious literary prize in France until this day. I think for a French writer, um, the best thing might be the Nobel Prize, but then the Prix de Goncourt. This is like the second best thing you can get. Okay, I'm going to give you a quote of him. He writes this in his diary. Um, this, is, this is a conversation he had with friends. Um, you don't know, princesse, what service you have rendered to the Tuileries. The Tuileries, they are the royal palace. Um, how much your salon has disarmed hatred and anger. How, how much of a buffer you have been between the government and those holding a pen. Flaubert and I, if you had not bought us, so to speak, with your grace, your attention, your friendship, we would have been ardent critics of the emperor and the empress. He says, I and Flaubert would have been your enemies. Which Flaubert? Gustave Flaubert. Um, I mean, you probably have read or heard of one novel of his, haven't you? Uh, yes, but I'm terrible with uh, French. Uh, I want to say Madame Bovary, but I'm going to yeah, embarrass bigo. myself. Uh, ah, yeah, yes, okay. Madame Bovary, yeah. A not so degenerate novel for French circumstances, which is which is surprising. But still, um, yeah, the subject matter, okay. Anyways, um, apart from writing um, very bad novels on uh, licentious women, uh, he was quite based. Um, he wrote about the commune, after the commune, because um, at this point in time, you already had a republic. At this point in time, Napoleon III was already overthrown so this is when people show their mask, right? Um, yeah, Napoleon, you're a great guy. And then when he's uh, in exile, yeah, I always fought against uh, the empire. No, no, no. After Napoleon is gone, he is sad. And this is what he has to say about the Paris Commune. I think the whole commune should have been sent to the galleys. These bloody imbeciles should all be forced to clear the ruins of Paris in chains. But that would have injured humanity, for one is clever, clement towards ferocious dogs who have bitten their masters. Um, they really, you really have to read some of their letters at the time. It's I have to great. say the idea of bringing back the galleys is one that uh, I love. I mean, it, what could be greener? Um, you know, no fossil fuels. You know, bring back the galleys. And you, you could know, actually put them in, uh, in in confinement facilities with rowing machines at first to get them up to uh, yes. to speed. So it seems, it seems that might be the path forward for the future. Absolutely. And you would eradicate um, unemployment. That, that would be a build back better that I would support. I would sign um, a referendum right away to support this motion. Um, 
so uh, just another example, like Emile Zola. Um, we know him from uh, Jacques, uh, the Dreyfus affair, where he um, defended uh, the Jewish Alsatian officer uh, Dreyfus. Um, yeah, but in terms of the commune, he was also very based. I'm just going to give you another quote. There's a, there's a quote from shortly after the commune. The bloodbath that the people of Paris have just taken was probably a horrible necessity to calm some of their fevers. You will now see it rise in wisdom and splendor. Um, one of the very, very few established writers who takes um, a conciliatory position is Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo is, uh, he's always been a Democrat. He's been a Democrat under Napoleon III. Uh, I mean, you know him from Les Miserables, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. He's a giant, literary, a literary giant. But he asks for clemency. He says, no, 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 we shouldn't be too tough on the communards. And he is vociferously attacked in public opinion by all the other writers. This is an exception to do that. The um, public opinion is really set against the commune. And I think this shows you how good the cultural policies of Napoleon III were, actually. Yeah, it certainly um, points to uh, the, the approach of Augustus with uh, Mekanas you know, in terms of uh, writers like Horace and the rest, where he brought them in to ensure that they got their marching orders from from a particular place. And that also uh, underscores the whole business of how elite systems only break down when they don't allow a certain amount of upward mobility. And we may be, you know, seeing something of that sort, at least in terms of uh, competence. You know, bio-Leninism is by definition a kind of upward mobility, but not of any kind of... Uh, uh, um, capable class, not of any kind of competent class. You know, it's the advancement of the incapable as opposed to elites that allow a certain number of them to climb up the ladder. Um, and I think that we see that with the, uh, the policy that you've been discussing here. It is great that you bring up Augustus, though he promoted slaves, he only promoted the brightest. We cannot claim that today um, the brightest of slaves are promoted through the ranks of our institutions. Uh, no, no, indeed. Quite the contrary. Alrighty. Where does this lead to? This meta politics, this cultural, this educational policy. It leads to wins. Uh, they, they are just winning. Napoleon is just winning all the time. Big, big, big time. Um, so here you see the French legislative elections of 1869. Um, here are the leaders of the factions. Uh, I'll make it short. We have a 70.5% majority for Napoleon. Some are more liberal, some are more conservative, but he has the parliament in his hands. Uh, 10 million voters, 7.3 million vote. This is an 80% voter turnout. These are numbers that we could dream of today uh, in Germany. I don't know how it is in the US, but this is a very high turnout. Um, we should also keep in mind that um, there, are, there are official candidates um, advanced by the, uh, chosen by the ministry, uh, by the a minute by the interior minister um, and uh, they have a lot of advantages when it comes to elections they have more funds and the more radical um, candidates of the opposition um, they might face some problems that placards might be ripped off but um, nonetheless this really shows that this uh, meta politics that napoleon the third is engaged in is very effective um but he will be kicked out very soon 
Um, here again, we see the parliament and green and lilac. This is all Napoleon III. So it's a huge majority. Um, now let's talk about the opposition uh, against Napoleon III, um, the violent opposition. Um, in 1858, there is an assassination attempt on his life. Um, somebody throws a bomb um, at his... Uh, oh boy, the name escapes me in English. How can that be? The Kutcher? Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> his carriage? Help. His carriage his, or his coach? His carriage. Yeah, his carriage. Uh, well, nothing happens. He doesn't die. A lot of people die, but um, Napoleon III survives. Who was the assassin? The assassin was Felice Orsini. As you can see from the name, he's Italian. Um, but the Or Orsinis, are, that's a very, very famous Roman noble family. Do you know if he was from the aristocracy? Uh, in that case, it would have been uh, Felice Dorsini, but um, he doesn't have a D um, huh. in the name that indicates he's a nobleman. Ha, huh, so the, the D there of or whatever, it's just like uh, like Fon. Ha, huh, I see. Um, Felice Orsini is a Carbonari. You know, uh, last time uh, you made a um, poll on Twitter, you were asking the audience, would you like um, the next episode to be on the Carbonari or on the Paris Commune? People wanted the Paris Commune, but I'm going to sneak in a little bit of it here. The nice. Carbonari were a um, movement for national unification in Italy. It was a movement of secret societies. Um, Felice Orsini is uh, put to death by the guillotine. Um, and uh, what is quite interesting it is that he was aided and abetted by Simon Bernard. Simon Bernard is a uh, French person who took exile in London. And he trained Felice Orsini in using explosives and he procured him money because he hated Napoleon III and he wanted to see him dead. What is quite interesting about Simon Bernard is that he is a Freemason. He is a member of the London Lodge, Les Philadelphians, the Philadelphians, a lodge of French radicals who are exiled in London. We will see this lodge, the Philadelphians, come up again. They were instrumental in founding the first international. Now, Simon Bernard is put on trial in London because he is associated with the assassination attempt. And his guilt is proven in court. Can you believe it? The jury um, acquits him. The jury says, we were going to acquit you. Here we see perfidious Albion at its best. England spreading revolution. Um, I mean, they're on an island. They don't really have to care about what is going on on the continent, whether there are revolutions, whether the head of state is killed. This jury just acquits him. The, uh, the British press uh, celebrates this. Um, as a, a heroic act by the jury. Um, so here we see that London at this point can be used as a base for subversion by revolutionaries, by Freemasons. Now, we want to go a little deeper into the Carbonari. Giuseppe Garibaldi, he is the national hero of Italy. He was the military leader of the Carbonari, um, the movement for unification. Um, he joins Freemasonry in 1844. In 1864, Giuseppe Garibaldi becomes Grand Master of the Grande Oriente d'Italia, the Grand Orient of Italy, which is uh, styled on the French Grand Orient. Um, in 1871, the commune 
elects Garibaldi as the leader of the National Guard. But Garibaldi declines. He says, this is an internal matter of France, but I wish you all the best of luck. Um, and he supports the commune for their struggle for, quote, justice and human dignity. An no. early invocation of, uh, of social justice. Certainly yes. not the first, and as we have seen, not the last. Yes. Mm. What you see here is a print of the International Exposition in London. The audience at this moment might ask, what does the International Exposition have to do with the Paris Commune? It has a lot to do with it. Um, so in 1862, there was this international exhibition. 28,000 exhibitors um, showed their inventions, their art, their produce. Um, and the French workers sent a delegation to get in contact with their colleagues from Britain. And here, I am going to quote from, or I'm, I'm going to um, summarize uh, a work which is also in the bibliography by Ernest Edouard Fribourg, um, who was um, an engraver, so he was a craftsman, a founding member of the French section of the First International, and who was also a member of the delegation sent to the International Exposition. And here he describes how the French workers for the first time learned from the British colleagues that they work less hours, that they have higher pay. And why do they have higher pay? Because of trade unions. Um, Fribourg writes this book right after the Paris Commune. And he puts uh, trade unions uh, in, in italics. He doesn't translate it. So we see that this is a very new term uh, in France at that time. Um, and the English workers, they then train their French counterparts on how to do uh, strikes, how to negotiate with employees, how to set up banks, how to create trade unions. And this kicks off the labor movement in France. Perfidious Albion. <laughs> um, okay. Um, here we have uh, Henri Tolin. Um, he was also present at the International Exposition and he is the hero uh, of this uh, monography, the International Workingmen's Association by Fribourg, a good friend of him. Okay, uh, Henri Tolin, he is a metal worker, again, a craftsman. All, a lot of the revolutionaries are actually craftsmen. This, is, this was not the case in the earlier revolutions. He is also, would you have guessed, uh, a Freemason. Um, so, so this is some, I, I should point this out at the moment here because um, we think of Freemasonry uh, of uh, an elite endeavor. Uh, and it is the case that it is so in uh, Great Britain, in the US, in Germany. Um, but in France at that time, the lodges had opened their temples, their doors to uh, workers, to small shop owners. Um, at this point in time, um, around 40% of all the Freemasons in Paris are workers and small shop owners. This was not the case during the French Revolution. If you as a worker wanted to, uh, if, if you knocked on the door of the temple of a lodge, they would kick you out. But it has changed. Um, and uh, Henri Toulin, he learned from his uh, colleagues, his uh, British colleagues, at the exposition um, and he um, writes a manifesto, the Manifesto of 60, which is published in L'Opinion Nationale, a newspaper in Paris. 
on the 17th of February, 1864. Um, and here, 60 uh, Paris workers sign this uh, proclamation. They sign with their name. They give their profession, uh, membership in workers' societies, street address, uh, everything. Um, so they say, here we are. That's what I stand for. Um, I'm just going to give you some of their professions. Uh, most of them are typographers, very important. They are in printing. Uh, masons, tailors, chisellers, um, and also 11 of them are delegates to the International Exposition. Um, this uh, manifesto has the following demands. Uh, the same rights for employers and employees in case of litigation. Um, Napoleon III will grant this a few months later. Um, the right to form trade unions and the right to strike. Liberty of the press, separation of state and church, and the right to public, free, and compulsory education. And of course, separation of the state and the church, because at that time, um, uh, most poor people, they don't send their children to school. And those who send their children to school, uh, around 40% of the schools are run by priests, monks, and nuns. And he wants to kick them out. And of course, he wants to remove Catholicism as a subject from the cu curricula. Mm -mm -mm. State education. Yes. Mm -hmm. Secular. Yes. Secular no state no homeschooling. <laughs> yes. um, uh, but, but that isn't a topic for us in Germany. We can't homeschool. We are forced to send our children to those magnificent schools where they learn how to shove a dildo. Yes. Um, I mean, <laughs> at this point in time, this is what's Woo! happening. Um, Shut it down. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, the, the rainbow colored obey dildo, which we're all expected to wear in the proper orifice. Yes. Moving right along. Um, yeah. This manifesto uh, fails. Um, only 495 votes in the elections. Uh, so this is uh, the, 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 this manifesto presents um, the labor um, the labor faction for the upcoming elections, but it fails. Only around 500 votes. Um, yeah. But now, Proudhon steps in. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. He is, at this time, probably the most influential uh, socialist thinker in France. Big time. Um, he is also a typographer. He starts off as a typographer, but then he receives a scholarship for classical education. So he is very, very well trained uh, intellectually. He becomes a Freemason in 1845. Um, and the, the way how he becomes a Freemason is very interesting and very telling. He becomes a Freemason at the Lodge Sincerité, uh, Honesty, in Besançon. Um, and first, the Freemasons, they hesitate to accept this uh, ouvrier savant, this uh, knowledgeable worker, because of his low status. Um, but then, finally, they say, all righty, uh, we accept you. And during his initiation, he is asked the following question. What is your duty towards God? And he answers with a simple phrase. La guerre. War. War is my duty again towards God. Um, the Freemasons. Proto, proto, proto jihad. I mean, that's pretty hardcore. Yeah. Um, but I mean, war against God. Um, so this is a very atheist, a very atheist answer. And the Freemasons are shocked. But nonetheless, they accept it. They gloss it over. He is a worker and an atheist. And they accept him into their lodge. Note that at that time, the Grand Orient, the Grand Lodge of France, has um, the rule that everybody has to believe in God. 
Yeah, specifically, they must be one of the religions of the book. So mm -hmm. that's uh, that's a very obviously that meant that in practice in Europe at that time it was you know the overwhelming majority were Christians and a few Jews and in theory Muslims could be admitted I suppose you know someone could extend it so far that um, uh, 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 Zoroastrians could but <clears throat> yeah it'd be a very very strange thing and entirely contradictory both to their ideology and their rules to allow some sort of uh, some sort of non-believer. Uh, we already saw that Adolphe Crimieux, a Jew, is a Freemason. And not only that, he is the Grand Commander of the Supreme Council. Um, but at this time, you have to swear an oath on God. Not on Yahweh, not on Jehovah, not on Allah. On God, on the Christian God. But, I mean, okay, yeah. We can make an exception here. He believes in God, but let him, uh, whatever. Um, but I mean, being an atheist, being a materialist, this is quite a thing. But still, they say, okay, yeah, why not? Uh, you can become a member. Um, so that tells you a lot about what is going on in those uh, French lodges at the moment. Um, he becomes famous with his work, What is Property, uh, published in 1840. The simple answer is uh, la propriété se le vol. Uh, property, property is theft. Um, in 1865, uh, so one year after the publication of this manifesto, he publishes on the political capacity of the working class. Here he celebrates the bold action of Henri Toulin and he says, Good job. Continue. This is like, for a socialist in France at that time, this is like being retweeted by Elon Musk or being invited to the Joe Rogan show today. Uh, this gets you a lot of traction. Um, here we have uh, a painting by Gustave Courbet uh, of uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon from 1865. So we see at this moment, he's kind of a superstar. People... I mean, Gustave Courbet, uh, his, his, his style of painting is quite good. I mean, that people that like um, uh, like superstars like Gustave Courbet, they paint you. This, this means something. Uh, he has uh, Pierre uh, Proudhon, he has really made it. Uh, Gustave Courbet, by the way, he will become a very important figure uh, in the Paris Commune. He is going to be the one who says, hey, let's tear down uh, the Vendôme column. But uh, Gustave Courbet is uh, not a Freemason, is one exception. Alrighty. Um, now we see the workers' movement in France has uh, started. And let's go to the first international. Um, the first international was founded uh, September the 26th 1864 in London. Um, what I've shown you here is a, a picture of uh, George Potter, who is a um, founding member of the London Trades Council. The London Trades Council organized this meeting to found the First International. And he is also the editor-in-chief of the Beehive. That is a um, workers' newspaper printed in London, and this newspaper is, to my knowledge, the first printed source that mentions the First International. Um, he is not a Freemason, to my knowledge, so I looked a little bit at all the English people, because the First International was um, controlled by uh, Englishmen. Because it was in London, um, of course, there were a lot of Englishmen, sure. None of them, it seems, are Freemasons. And this is very telling. Uh, I would say in England at that time, as a worker, you had no chance to become a Freemason. The opposite is true in France. Uh, the second most important person, George Odger. 
Uh, he's also a worker, a uh, leading trade unionist. He becomes the president of the General Council of the First International. Yeah. Um, and now, in this article by the Beehive from October the 1st, 1864, which is called International Meeting of French and English Workmen, uh, this article describes what happens at the founding meeting of the First International. Uh, so first, uh, George Odgers um, delivers a speech to everybody. And then Henri Toulin, whom we've already uh, seen as being responsible for this manifesto, is also present. And he delivers a speech in French. And this speech, uh, oh, no, no, no. first, uh, we, we're going to get a quote from Marx on uh, Henri Toulin. Marx was also present at the founding meeting of the First International. And Marx writes a letter to Friedrich Engels uh, where he talks about Toulin. And he says that uh, Toulin. Uh, was at the head of the French delegation. And he says, the real Toulon is the real working men's candidate during the last Paris elections. A really nice guy. Okay. We know that Henri Toulon is a really nice guy. Straight from the Marxist mouth. Um, now, Toulon delivers a speech in French. And... Uh, Luckily, there is a French exiled person who translates the speech. This is uh, Victor Le Lubes. Victor Le Lubé. I couldn't find an image of him. Shady person. Uh, I couldn't find out when he died. Very, very shady. But um, he was definitely present. He is mentioned by Marx. He is mentioned in this newspaper article. He is mentioned in all the literature I read. So this person existed, but we don't have an image of him. Um, he probably preferred living in the shadows. Um, so Victor Lulubé, he translates the speech of Henri Tolin, and then he continues to deliver speeches uh, in English. He speaks English very well. Um, first, he outlines the program of the French Commission, of the French delegation. And then he calls for the creation of a uh, general commission of uh, the First International, seated in London. And that all the members of the First International have to create subsections in their respective countries. This is exactly what will happen. Um, and he calls for a next meeting in Belgium. This will happen. Everything will happen as he proposes it. Um, we see right here in this newspaper article um, where they say, who are the members of the General Commission? They are all Englishmen. Most of them are all Englishmen. There's only one French person. This is Lulubé. Lulubé becomes a member of the General Commission of the First International. And also Dr. Marx. Dr. Marx is, of course, Karl Marx uh, as German representative. Um, and now, Victor Lulubé is a member of the Philadelphians. We already mentioned the lodge. Um, it is a French lodge in London, uh, very radical, very socialist. And we already mentioned it. Where did we mention it? Oh, yeah. Simon Bernard, also a member of the Philadelphians. So Simon Bernard was the person who trained um, Felicio Orsini in London, who would later try to assassinate Napoleon III. Heavy, heavy involvement of Freemasons in political assassinations and creation of revolutionary organizations. All righty. What does Karl Marx say about Lulubé? 
he mentions him in a letter to Friedrich Engels. Uh, first, he says, uh, Lulibé is uh, very talented. He grew up in Jersey and London, uh, speaks great English, and he is a uh, uh, he, he is very good at connecting between the uh, English workers and the French workers. And Marx says it was Victor Lulibé who invited him to join this meeting. It is only because of Lulibé that Marx was present at the first meeting of the First International. Um, and now come a striking quote by Marx. He writes this to Engels. I knew that true powers, Marx puts this in quotation marks in this letter, I knew that true powers were present on, in, on the London and Paris side, which is why I decided against my rule of declining any such invitations. Usually Marx would have been in the library of London writing and reading away, but he knew there were real powers and that's why he took part in this. And the, the obvious question is, do we know what he meant by that expression, true powers? We don't. Um, of course, who he talks about the London and the Paris side. And the London side, of course. We have the leaders of the London Trades Council, uh, the person, the editor in chief of the um, most influential working newspaper. These are the London powers, for sure. Who are the French powers? The seminal persons on the French side are Henri Toulin and Le Lubé who are both Freemasons. Are they the powers because they are connected to any lodge? We don't, I, I, I cannot tell you from the letter, but this would be a hypothesis. Alrighty, um, just uh, very briefly on the secondary sources. Mm, this is uh, a paper by uh, Boris Nikolaevsky. He is a Menshevik. Uh, a Russian historian. First, he migrated to Berlin, then to Paris, and finally to the US. Um, so um, I can recommend you to read his uh, paper, Secret Societies, oops, typo, and the First International from 1966. I'm going to give you a quote. The part played by the individual Philadelphians in 1864 was enormous. Victor Lulubé, to name the most important, personally undertook the tremendous work of organizing the meeting of September 28, 1684, at which the General Council of the First International was elected. That certainly suggests that Lulubé was... Uh... Was perhaps, but it suggests he was perhaps the power player. Um, he would have been as well as uh, whomever these persons were. Um, I'm sorry, whoever these persons were that he was uh, that he was working with, and it seems rather fitting then that there wouldn't have been an image of him. Um, it would be interesting to see whether or not uh, there were images, and they're just that you know they've simply become very difficult to find. Uh, it suggests to me looking specifically at him uh, for records about him might yield some uh, some further insights. Definitely. Uh, should I be in London? Uh, I'm going to uh, have a look at the archives. Um, okay. Um, we don't uh, want to gloss over the um, Carbonari. There is also an Italian delegate. It is Luigi Wolf. Wolf, as you know, Semigorg is a typical Italian name. Not. Um, yeah, I was about a... to say that. That sounds like a German name, Wolf. Yeah. 
it sounds like a German Jewish name. Oh, really? Wolf? Yes. Really? I had no idea. I would think that that would be a proper Teutonic name, you know, device of Ulf. Yes, yes. But I think it's because of double F. Um, double F, uh, there are a lot of Jews who have a uh, Wolf with two Fs as their family. Ah, like Wolfel or something, like moving more in, in that direction. Hmm. But, but, but it is not a typical Ashkenazi name. It is not typical. Yeah. Um, yeah, he is the representative of the Italian workers. We come again to Giuseppe Garibaldi. Giuseppe Garibaldi, the military leader of the Carbonari, Luigi Wolf Carbonari. Um, Marx said in a letter that Luigi Wolf is the personal secretary of Giuseppe Garibaldi. Well, true powers. Um, five months before Luigi Wolf takes uh, part in this meeting, Giuseppe Garibaldi is elected Grand Master of the Grande Oriente d'Italia, of the Grand Orient of Italy, of the Grand Lodge of Italian Freemasonry. And according to Marc de Jod, um, our French Freemasonic professor, Garibaldi, initiated all his offices into Freemasonry. So we can suspect that Luigi Wolf was also initiated into Freemasonry, being so close to Garibaldi. Um, and uh, again, we have the connection that we were mentioning before. Felice Orsini, Carbonari, Luigi Wolf, Carbonari, Simon Bernard, member of the Philadelphians, the French exile lodge in London. Um, and here, Victor Lulubé, also a member of the Philadelphians. Um, this, at this moment, uh, you cannot uh, overlook those uh, dots that seem to connect to a greater picture. Yeah, and the, the unification of Italy, I just double-checked the, uh, the dates. It looks like it ran from, what, 1848 to 1871. And so... Uh, it would appear that uh, as things are being consolidated in Italy, perhaps true powers uh, decide that it might be uh, worthwhile to go ahead and make a move on uh, France at precisely the time that they suffered such a humiliating defeat from the Prussians and their German allies. And presumably the uh, national sentiment would be something of a powder keg that could be manipulated. Just a guess, absolutely uh, raw speculation, but uh, it seems to be borne out by the points you're making here. That could be the case. I mean, uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi was an ardent socialist. Um, he didn't have the upper hand when the Italian state was formed, um, but he was also fighting on the side of the French. He was invited by the French Republican conservative government to fight on the side of the French against the Germans. He was later invited by the commune to become their leader, but he said, this is too hot for me. Yes, uh, and, you know, and I, would, I would suspect that he would have the real powers behind him. I would not have thought of Garibaldi as himself being the foremost figure. You know, generally these folks have backing. And for him to be careful in that fashion would suggest to me that people would want to be very, very careful with their gains in Italy and not threaten them by getting involved in this. And when what certainly did turn out to be a misadventure, uh, you know, the, the commune. But I, I know nothing of such things. I'm just guessing and without proper information. Yeah, it seems Garibaldi played his cards right in declining this generous offer. Um, now let's come to, oops, the slides are going crazy here. Ah, yeah, this is also highly important. So the first international was just founded and now we need subsections in each country. The French subsection of the first international is founded by these three persons, Henri Tola, 
we already mentioned him, is a Freemason. Ernest Edouard Fribourg is also a Freemason. He wrote this book. He wrote this book on the First International. So we have already two Freemasons. Who is the third one? Charles Mathieu Limousin, also a Freemason. The whole section of the First International in France is founded by Freemasons. Um, and uh, on the 1st December 1864, Lulubé, uh, so this guy sends a letter to Karl Marx where he informs Marx about the names and addresses of these persons who run the French section of the international so that Marx can get in contact with them. Okay, um, now that we've outlined the involvement of Freemasons in revolutionary movement assassination attempts on Napoleon III and the First International, let's get right in to the matter of the Franco-Prussian War. Um, I will just very briefly why this war happened. Uh, I think it was a joke. Um, the Spanish parliament offers the throne to a Prussian prince. France is pissed. Now we're, go we're going to have the Germans on the east and the west. They don't want it. The French press goes crazy. The parliament is outraged. The French ambassador demands from the Prussian king in an, in an impertinent manner that he renounces uh, the Prussian right to the Spanish throne for eternity. What is that? Um, the Prussian king says, okay, I've already told um, this prince um, to reject the offer. And the prince publicly says, I refuse the offer. I will not do it. But the French ambassador, no, you have to swear for eternity that you will never do it again. Um, this is nothing that a uh, monarch of honor will commit himself to. Why should he? Of course, he says, um, take a hike. Um, so what does France do? Um, the only rational thing in this situation is to declare war on Germany because the Prussian king was so insolent. Um, today at the university and at school, they tell me Germany, it, it was the fault of Germany, it was the fault of Bismarck because he published a letter. It might have been that Bismarck pu published a letter um, where the French ambassador was described as being impertinent, but this does not change the fact that the French demands were out of proportion. Um, the, the, the French press was already writing about um, taking the whole uh, regions of the Rhine from Germany. Um, the narrative should be the French were the French were quite insolent and they received the beating. Okay, I will. Um, uh, but it, 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 I, I cannot wrap my head around how this is being uh, how history is taught in uh, German schools. Um, but um, anyways, it is not so important here. Um, so France declares war. Okay, um, this is a failure. Um, 19th July, they declare war. And on the 2nd of September, crushing defeat at the Sedan, at the Battle of Sedan. 100,000 prisoners, uh, 100,000 soldiers taking prisoners. Um, and among them, Napoleon III, um, who has to capitulate. Um, the French, oh, come on. Um, so the French are not, um, ready to accept this and they have a, a coup d'etat. Um, so they, um, seize the government, which is uh, in Paris and they, uh, create a provisional government. They proclaim the third Republic. And this government is called Government of National Defense. And you can mark this date in red letters. This is the last time um, a monarch has ruled France. From this time on, France will be a republic until this day. 
Um, and again, we can play the guessing game, Semigog. How many of those ministers do you believe are Freemasons? Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that... Um, Oh, what the hell? I was going to say that one wasn't, but I'm going to go ahead and say that they all are. This time they, they all are. are. This time they all are. Okay, let's ask our good uh, Masonic professor friend, Marc Dujot. Marc Dujot, how many are Freemasons? Uh, this time, not so many. There's ah, just, but uh, still, still a majority. Still a majority. Hmm? And again, we have uh, Adolf Cremieux. Um, our Jewish Freemason, who was already present in the 1848 revolution, Again, Minister for Justice, he secures citizenship for all the Jews in Algeria. Um, all righty. And now uh, you have a Republican, liberal, bourgeois government in Paris. But this is not enough for the social revolutionaries. So... Um, a central committee is formed in this uh, term Comité Central. A uh, central committee will um, appear uh, again in history. Um, it is a central committee um, and they send delegates from each arrondissement. Uh, Paris is divided into 20 units, arrondissements. And these arrondissements, they elect delegates and they form this central committee. And this is a revolutionary organization. Um, what do they do on the 15th of September? They um, place red placards on all the walls of Paris. And this placard demands city administration. All the officers have to be elected and they have to responsible to the people. Also, the whole police has to be elected uh, because right now the police officers they were put in place by um, the second empire so they are conservative and they want to get rid of this um, social reforms immediate expropriation of all foodstuffs so free food for everyone free rents for everyone national defense um, immediate election of officers of the National Guard and the distribution of weapons to the people. Mass attack, levé en masse, total war against the Prussians. That's what they demand. Four days later, on the 19th of September, Paris is totally surrounded by the Prussians. No one gets in, no one gets out. <laughs> whoops just four days <laughs> yes um and uh, the uh, things get more and more out of hand at this point in time because there is no communication um i mean you can send letters in and out with balloons and everything but you cannot walk into the city anymore and <laughs> this is a tough situation uh because now paris is on its own Paris is as it is. It is progressive. It is liberal. Um, a lot of intellectuals. Um, a lot vast, of uh, vast, vast numbers of people not known for their self control. Yes. A lot of uh, bio Leninist uh, potential in the Faubourg, in the uh, Quartier Populaire, uh, as you say in French. Um, and this leads to a rather um, unstable situation. Um, in October, uh, 31st of October, radicals storm the city hall um, where the French government is uh, placed. Uh, but uh, this dies down. The National Guard is still loyal. Um, and uh, two days after this uh, coup d'etat, this failed coup d'etat, enter Auguste Blanqui. Auguste Blanqui is another giant. I already mentioned. Um, oh, my slide is slow, um, but I need to go back here. Uh, Auguste Blanqui is another giant. 
Pierre Proudhon is the other giant. They are the most important socialist thinkers in France at that time. Not Marx. Not a lot of French know Marx at this moment. He writes in German and English. He is not translated. Um, but Proudhon and Blanqui, they are highly influential. And Blanqui, not only intellectually, but also from the point of action. He is an ardent revolutionary. He spends 30 years of his life in prison. His nickname is L'Enfermé, the imprisoned one. He was a tough one. You have to give him that. Um, he joins Freemasonry in the 1840s. Um, he then is imprisoned. He left for Brussels uh, shortly in London. Uh, right of the time when the first international is founded. Um, and then when uh, Napoleon III is overthrown, he comes back. He is elected officer, uh, he is elected as officer of a battalion of the National Guard. He has high prestige among the working classes. They admire him as a guard. Um, he creates the newspaper La Patrie en Danger, uh, The Fatherland in Danger. Um, at this moment, I just have to destroy another myth about the Paris Commune. You know, you will see socialists push the narrative, yeah, this was so international. It was about humanity. It was about workers' rights. <clears throat> but if you look at the people who were in leading roles, if you look at their newspapers, if you look at their letters, you will see that it is that it is nationalism that they were appealing to. Kick out the Prussians, throw out the Germans. This is how you mobilize the masses. You don't mobilize the masses by talking about the proletariat. And it really does suggest to me, I hope I'm not cutting off your main point. I'll make this very fast, but it does suggest to me I, I would go looking strongly and closely for a German role. German, of course, you know, Germany did not exist at this point. But um, but I would be looking for a German role in fomenting this sort of uh, trouble. I mean, we, we know that just a short time later, you know, 50 years later, the Germans to great and dramatic effect, you know, stuck Lenin on a train and sent him to Russia to destabilize, you know, their enemies with a whole Eastern front for them in World War I. Oddly, the, the, the Prussians show up and surround Paris, which amplifies the very sort of, um, of nationalist fervor and could be expected to amplify the type of nationalist fervor that you're talking about. And at the same time, it ensures that Paris itself is hermetically sealed from intervention from other powers outside, you know, other French powers outside the capital who might want to put things right. They can't get to them. Um, and it also, uh, you know, <clears throat> as all this gets going, as I'm sure we'll see for much of this period, the, 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 the German forces remained, uh, outside Paris, uh, surrounding it and making sure that nobody could get in and out without their approval while all this is going on. And then it, it seems at least possible that when they left, they left weapons for these people and the French would just have to deal with it afterwards. So I don't know if you looked into this at all. And again, I didn't want to uh, cut away your, your primary point, but pr d does this please finish your thought and, and let me know if you've seen any details to suggest one way or another, whether anything like that was going on. I feel absolutely free to interrupt me any moment. I have my notes. Um, I will get back to my point. Um, you are making a fascinating point here. I didn't think about it. Um, I mean, in with hindsight, we know that uh, the German foreign ministry uh, financed uh, the Bolsheviks in the First World War. Um, and with that knowledge, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to assume that similar things were occurring 
it would definitely make sense. There would be a motive. Divide et impera. Uh, you would sow uh, trouble uh, among the French, making them uh, tear apart each other. Um, and this is something I will definitely take a look at. It would be, um, I mean, uh, I'm not aware that um, this is something which uh, is discussed in literature, in research, but it would be great if we could uh, find something out here. Um, I'll have a look. Um, okay, back to uh, Auguste Blanqui, uh, a social revolutionary giant in France. He founds the newspaper The Fatherland in Danger. <clears throat> um, and uh, you see on the right-hand side uh, the edition of the 2nd of November. So this is uh, two days after the insurrection. And you read... Vive la commune. Uh, so he pushes the commune um, a few months before it comes into existence. Um, and uh, if you look very closely on the upper right, you see a red box. Um, I've shown you this red box on top. Uh, 12 of Brumaire year 79 uh, Blanqui adopts the revolutionary calendar that was introduced in 1792 when the first French Republic was founded this is why Blanqui is writing in the year 79 but for uh, so, so that people can understand it here we have the uh, Christian calendar on the right in brackets. Now, this is a very interesting detail. Now, the coup d'etat fails. Um, the government, government of national defense, which is uh, predominantly run by Freemasons, conducts a plebiscite where they ask the people of Paris um, are you okay with our politics? And lo and behold, 90% support the government of national defense. So this is a very clever move and a crushing defeat to the revolutionaries. Yeah, though, of course, the question must be raised whether or not the, any of these elections reflected anything other than what the people counting the votes wanted them to but yes mm. but it is not uh, as for instance in the german democratic republic uh, the communist germany all the votes were like 98 99 percent it is still 10 percent but you of course um we we are talking war here there won't be fair and open elections, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and it also could be argued that that at that early stage of uh, manipulating so-called democratic votes, it may have been that they were just they were less brazen in their lying. They probably sat around tables saying to each other, "Oh, come on now, oh, Henri, how could you imagine that they would believe ninety-eight uh, percent? We have to have it at least to be uh, plausible." You know, and later in life, of course, they're like, no, we don't just lie I, our asses off. I, I, I think they had a lot of uh, mail in voting. <clears throat> Drop boxes, no doubt. <clears throat> fortification, election okay. fortification. But, but of course, um, I mean, this plebiscite being legit or not, um, the radicals are not uh, amused and they continue the struggle. There is another placard. Um, on the 5th of January, um, the Prussians start bombarding Paris. So this is something when you read uh, Bismarck's um, autobiography, he always complains, where are those cannons? You have to get the artillery here. And he always complains that there were uh, people putting stones in his way. And then finally the cannons are there. And he says, go bombard Paris. Okay, that's what happens. And um, on the night... Where, um, the bombardment start, and in the same night, um, the Central Committee of the Revolutionaries, they put up a second placard. 
to the people of Paris. Um, and here they um, hold the provisional government, this government, responsible for the failure against the Germans in the war. And they say the provisional government continues the policies of Napoleon III. And in order to defend Paris against the Germans, we have to create a commune with free public meals and mass attack. Uh, attack on mass. I like this word. Um, Total War is also nice. Um, you see how video games just um, copy all those uh, fancy um, statements from history. Um, now, the following day, the radicals break into a prison and they free uh, people who were incarcerated uh, do it during the uh, insurrection of the 31st of October. So um, Paris Some, is... Something a, of a Bastille Day echo. And there, there were a lot of Bastille Days, yeah. Um, and um, now the situation gets uh, worse. So on the 18th of January, 1861, the German Empire is proclaimed. So this happens in Versailles, in the old palace of the French kings. Because at this moment, Paris is uh, encircled by German forces. And uh, Versailles is uh, around uh, uh, 30 kilometers um, west of Paris. And here the Germans and the French negotiate about a peace deal. And while we are there, Versailles is a fancy place. Okay, let's proclaim the German Empire. And the German princes, they hereby proclaim um, uh, William, the Prussian king, emperor of the Germans. Wilhelm, yes, and it seems uh, rather interesting. It must just be a must just be a coincidence. I mean, how could it be anything other than a coincidence that you have people talking about how great powers are actually behind it this time? So somebody like Marx will show up. There are attempts to get Garibaldi involved. You've got Paris surrounded and the not only the capital city but the government and all its organization in absolute chaos utter chaos <clears throat> and it just so happens that at that time just wacky coincidence 1871 is when uh the unification of italy reaches its crescendo when rome is taken and 1871 is when this german empire is proclaimed Weird. It almost makes it seem as though someone uh, put the pressure on France in such fashion that it would be paralyzed and unable to act and would have to accept these affairs in Germany and in Italy as being uh, a fait accompli because, uh, you know, what on earth are they going to do about it? And of course, all through history, we can see, see that the, uh, the French took a very, very strong interest in what happened in Italy you know, marching across the Alps and getting involved there over and over and over again over the decades and centuries. But now it just gets proclaimed, you know, a united Italy. And meanwhile, uh, uh, Germany it happens to be the very same year and the very same year as the commune. It just all sorts sort of comes together. It, it suggests perhaps that uh, people were pulling strings behind the scene to uh, the manifest their new vision of uh, of Europe. Uh, during our Illuminati episode, you had a uh, wonderful um, formulation. The zeitgeist was huffing and puffing. Indeed, something, some, I mean, I was born at night, but not last night. So yeah, I tend to think that perhaps there's uh, a little bit more going on there in the background. Though I would not go so far as to say that it was very clearly um a uh something that was strictly um utopians you know because there were there were powers that in play you know it could be that there was a victory for the forces of uh, unification and utopianism in italy perhaps i don't know i'm no 
I, I'm almost ignorant as regards the uh, Italian unification, almost completely ignorant. But, you know, it could be that there are, um, uh, it could be that there were, you know, groups on either side there, whereas, you know, so that one, one group was backing the Italian thing and trying to get something going in France and, uh, Germany just took that as an opportunity to make their, what would be Germany, uh, took it as the opportunity to make their own proclamation. It could have been to counter what they saw happening in Italy. You know, I don't know those details, but this just stinks of grander uh, manipulations. Um, I see you want to uh, do another show on another topic, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still hope we can get to uh, World War One at some point, as I've done all my reading on uh, Crowley to refresh on that. And uh, Theodore uh, Royce. Royce. You, know, you, you know, we haven't really dealt with uh, the Anglosphere at this moment. I mean, the American Revolution, England. Um, we, we, we're just dealing, with, for instance, with England um, as a, uh, uh, for instance, here, the founding of the first uh, international, it's just a side, a side thing. But I think we should also look at the Anglosphere a little more. Um, okay. Yes, and also we have uh, uh, Patricius von Kemp von 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 Kempen going uh, ape shit, saying Germans preceded the Second German Empire, and he seems to be taking issue with me, you know, not using the term Germans. Um, I don't know if you want to uh, to address that. That's beyond my knowledge of German history. Well, as a, a cultural nation, um, they precede, of course, the Second Empire. Um, but um, I don't see you um, having said anything to the opposite. Um, so anyways, um, so after the proclamation, 10 days after, um, the French and the German government, they sign an armistice. The war is over. No more fighting. Uh, France has more or less capitulated. Um, and now France is able to hold legislative elections and the results are striking um here in blue in light blue these are the orleanists um and in uh, dark blue these are the legitimists i'm just gonna scroll back a lot here to show you whom we are talking about the orleanists belong to the House of Orléans. Oh boy. The House of Orléans. This is the House of Orléans. This is Louis Philippe. He was King of France from 1830 to 48. He belongs to the cadet branch of the House of Bourbon. And the legitimists are the true, if you will, kings of France who have ruled France for centuries. Um, Louis the 16th was of the house of Bourbon he was killed and then after Napoleon was defeated the Bourbon monarchy was restored these are the legitimists so these two parties carry the election big big time they have a uh, together they have a majority of I think uh, 65% let's see um Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yes, 62%. They have an absolute majority. They can pass any law they want. Um, they can um, choose anyone as president as they want. They can, at this moment, um, restore monarchy. But they don't. They fail. As I've already mentioned, 1870 is the year where France turns into a republic for good. How can this happen? My only explanation is that these two parties, the Orleanists and the Legitimists, um, are unable to find a common ground um, because in the past there was a lot of hatred between those, those two houses. I think this is another example of why conservatives always lose. It would have been so easy. They had all the power. But it also shows you how effective um, the cultural, the 
metapolitical um, efforts of Napoleon III were to just have uh, Catholicism as a subject in school, to have schools run by monasteries and by priests. And you see um, the effects of that in the elections, because at this time, I think 85% of uh, French live in rural areas. They are peasants, they are conservative. Um, now, um, to make matters worse, um, the Germans parade through Paris. There is an armistice, and the condition of this armistice is that the Germans occupy Paris until there is a definite peace treaty. And they parade around the Champs-Élysées. You can imagine that the, Par that the Parisians are going nuts. What a humiliation. Okay, they, the Germans have the parade on the 1st of March. And on the 3rd of March, the French National Assembly, which is in Bordeaux at that time, in the south of France, ratifies the peace treaty. So the Germans have to leave Paris. Um, and now the um, National uh, Assembly, the Parliament, moves to Versailles, from Bordeaux to Versailles. They don't go to Paris because they know, oh boy, in Paris, there's trouble. We, we, we rather uh, go to Versailles. Um, and uh, this is taken very badly by the radicals in Paris, uh, because Versailles is, of course, associated with the Ancien Regime, with monarchy. Um, and uh, the National Guard in Paris, they seize one million cartridges and at this point, they have taken over the east of Paris. So you have whole quarters, uh, you have whole arrondissements who are governing themselves, who, are, who, who do whatever they please. Um, and now, um, there is a new French government of the French Republic in Versailles. Yeah, This is a... Uh, how could you call it? Um, it is a republic, yes, but it is bourgeois, bourgeois liberals. Um, and uh, in Paris, uh, matters get worse by the day. Um, the French government comes from Versailles to Paris and tries to take the cannons back. This is what you mentioned in the beginning of the stream. Um, but the revolutionary forces of the National Guard in Paris are not prepared to give back the cannons and they kick out the French government. The French government retreats to Versailles and on the 18th of March the National Guard takes over the Hôtel de Ville, the public hall of Paris and this is the birth of the Paris Commune which will last for two more months. Um, and how do the revolutionaries justify this violent coup d'etat against a national assembly that was elected by universal male suffrage? Because that is a problem. The people have spoken. The citizens of France cast their vote. And now you are going to uh, uh, dethrone this democratically elected government. There's two arguments. The first one is nationalism. The Republican government failed against the Prussians and now we are going to continue the war. That's the first argument. The second argument is this. We are so progressive and you are so deplorable. Um, so they say the peasant population is backward and superstitious. They talk of a majorité rurale, rural, ma uh, rural majority. How could they accept to be ruled by 
such an ignorant majority. That's their argument. Um, so I think this is uh, another point where the myth that the Paris Commune was for democracy and all the rest of it just uh, uh, falls in itself like a house of cards. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like to say falls teeth first into the curb. Yes. And um, where do the Freemasons come in here? Let us talk a little bit about symbolism. I know, Semigog, we had a, uh, we talked 30 minutes um, about the painting, the Declaration of Human Rights last time. Let's talk a little bit about symbolism. It is very revealing. What do we see here? We see a medal, a commemorative medal for all the revolutionaries who took part in uh, the coup d'etat of the 18th of March. You see here, 18th of March, 1861. We have a triangle, liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, uh, fraternity, the motto of the first French Revolution. The motto of the Grand Orient, the Mother Lodge of France. Uh, in the middle, we have um, a uh, woman in antique style uh, wearing a laurel wreath. Um, and do we know uh, the triangle has sort of uh, Trinitarian deist associations? It also echoes the pediment of the Greek temples, which would associate it during this period with... Uh, with the idea of rationalism and progress. Um, do we know who the the head of the female figure is supposed to represent? Uh, that I don't know. Um, but um, it is quite sure for me that this is an allusion to the eye of providence, which we already met in the French Revolution of 1789. Uh, here in the last show, we talked about this painting the declaration of the rights of man and of the citizen on top we have the eye of providence a triangle um, this painting uh, was made by jean-jacques le barbier um, and uh, julie virouleau um, she is a french uh, researcher she showed in a 2011 paper that jean-jacques le barbier uh, frequented the Lodge Neuf Sœurs, which was instrumental in bringing about the French Revolution. And uh, I'm quite sure that this medal is also inspired by Freemasonry. It will get much uh, clearer when we look at the next uh, piece of evidence. Um, on the left side, you see a stamp that was used by the National Guard the National Guard that uh, conducted this coup d'etat. We see a stamp by the National Guard. Uh, here it says, République Française, French Republic, National Guard, Chef de la Quatrième Légion. Uh, chef, uh, chef means something different in English. Um, uh, boss, uh, yeah, leader, chief, chief yes. Chief of the, not the cook, not the cook of the 14th Legion. Yeah, chief of the 14th Legion, Commune of Paris. What do we have in the middle? We have an A and we have a, a thread hanging down. Yeah, um, symbolizing A for the first letter and alpha and the idea of literacy and letters, but it is a uh, plumb bob to ensure that things are plumb and square. So it's among the Masonic insignia. Indeed. Uh, the A is actually a, a level, which uh, is an instrument which is used to determine whether a surface is even. And the plumb bob, uh, you nailed it. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see a banner of the French lodge, Les Amis du Progrès, the Friends of Progress. This banner is from 1884. Um, and this uh, level, this A, with a plumb bob together, um, is a uh, symbol which is worn by a Masonic officer, le, uh, the premier surveillant, the first surveillor. Um, that's how you could translate it into English. And he 
uh, figures together with the venerable master and the second surveyor as um, I, well he is in charge of uh, conducting a lodge so it is undeniable that this symbol is inspired by freemasonry this is very very telling and do we know if any of the degree tables or anything feature this uh, thing with the bees and the hive um I'm not sure about that. The only thing I know of uh, as the, the symbolism of the, the the bees and the honey is an old Christian um, theme that you can find repeated in um, any number of emblematic or allegorical contexts where the idea is that the, um, the, the, the busy workers, the scholars gather together the um, honey of sacred scripture and the words and, uh, 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 basically sock it away or store it in the, what they refer to as the thesaurus of the, um, of the memory. And so they could delight in the sweetness of their gathered wisdom from the sacred words. They could have recourse to it in their memory. Somebody in the chat just mentioned that you can have the bees as a symbol of royalty, but this doesn't seem a context where they would want to echo either the... royalty or Christianity. It is the opposite of that. And now I'm so happy that we did the show on the Illuminati. Um, Adam Weishaupt, first, he wanted to call his order the, the Bienenorden, the Bee Order. Um, oh, luckily, wow. somebody told him, hey, how about the Illuminati? Um, the, I mean, the bee imagine, order. imagine all those Alex Jones, the Bee Order is ruling the world. <laughs> Right. We have to be so happy that they chose Illum Illuminati, right? I'm thinking yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and how do you say oh. B order in German? Uh, Bienenorden. <laughs> Bienenorden. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that would have been a, that would have been a branding flop, right? That, that, that would have been so cringe. Um, so Weishaupt's idea was that the members of the Bienenorden should gather the honey of wisdom and bring it to the bee queen. Who is the bee queen? That would be Adam Weishaupt. Um, it's good that he didn't chose this. Um, we can go even deeper. Um, so uh, Lessing uh, is a uh, very important German philosopher and also a Freemason. Lessing, I think, in uh, 1770 or so, uh, he wrote a um, pamphlet on Freemasonry. It's called uh, Ernst und Falk, Freimaurer Gespräche. Ernst and Falk, uh, Freemason talk. Uh, and here, two Freemasons uh, talk about um, Freemasonry. And uh, then Ernst mentions the bees. And he says, hey, the bees, just like the ants, um, they don't have a ruler. They cooperate with each other. And the bees are um, a metaphor for a human society for a would-be human society without rulers something that freemasons have to fight for yeah of course they leave out the idea of a queen and the notion of drones yes um yeah yeah that's one of those uh, unfortunate metaphorical frameworks that doesn't really hold up um under under uh, scrutiny Yes. Okay. Well, that's very helpful. So we have uh, we have a clear Masonic or at least secret society um, uh, uh, point of origin for the emblem of the uh, the bees in the hive. Then, and we have confirmed that uh, Freemasonic symbols are used in official documents by the Paris Commune. Um, now, on the twenty eighth of March, the Paris Commune is declared. This is what this print shows you. Um, just one day before, um, you had elections for the Paris Commune, for the government of the Commune. Um, and uh, according to Marc de Jod, our Freemasonic uh, professor, who wrote the Universal Dictionary on Freemasonry, 20 out of 60 deputies are Freemasons, so one third. Uh, and the uh, elected delegates 
um, they form their government in the Hotel de Ville, in the building that you see in this print. Um, here, we have 475,000 voters, inscribed voters, and only 230,000 cast a vote. So we have a uh, voter turnout of less than 50%. Remember that during the Second Empire and in the plebiscite conducted by the French Republic, you had a turnout of 80%. So this is very telling. And do we know anything uh, about whether or not some figures from masonry were, uh, though they were a third, uh, were they perhaps overrepresented in the top positions or anything like that? Do you happen to know? Mm. They were highly overrepresented in Paris at that time. You had maybe uh, give or take 6,000 Freemasons. You had way more than 1 million inhabitants. So do the math. They were highly overrepresented. This is something that does not surprise me because, of course, they are more educated. They have a better context and everything. But if you look at the former governments, um, here you have a majority of Freemasons in the government, and here you have a min minority of Freemasons. Interesting. Um, yeah, that seems like we should underscore it because it <clears throat> it marks a trend uh, of reduced influence to some extent. Um, this is this is a great observation, and it is true um, that uh, Freemasonry was not uh, like uh, behind the Paris Commune, like hundred percent. There were, of course, a lot of Freemasons that said this is going too far. I would actually say that um, the ma a majority of Freemasons thought this is going too far. This is going way too far. But the situation in Paris is a different one. Uh, Paris is, of course, more intellectual, more progressive, more radical. Um, and also here you have a very high proportion of workers and small shop owners among Freemasons. So the situation in Paris is a different one when compared to the rest of the country. And also in Paris, there are, uh, I would say, um, there's at least a good minority of Freemasons who is against the commune. So um, let us go to another Freemason, probably one of the most important ones during the uh, French Commune, if not the most important one, Jules Vallès. Uh, he is the founder and editor-in-chief of Le Cri du Peuple, The Cry of the People. This um, newspaper had by far the highest circulation during the Commune. It dominated the political landscape. Um, Jules Vallès became a Freemason in 1865. And there he, for instance, he delivered a discourse on Balzac uh, at the headquarters of the Grand Orient, uh, which was uh, very well received by his brothers. Um, and um, let's have a look at how he justifies the commune one day after the commune is proclaimed. So we're looking at the um, newspaper from the 29th of March, 1871. I'm going to give you some quotes. Those nation peddlers, he's talking about the Republican government. Those nation peddlers have sold the fatherland for their hatred against the Republic. Wow, so much international. After that, those Jews retired to Versailles. He talks about the uh, French government who flees from the revolutionaries to Versailles as Jews. Wow, very so much humanity. Is there um, is there any basis for his uh you know just looking at the numbers and the ethnicity of the people involved is does uh, it seem like it's raw conspiracy or is there anything no, to back no, it no, up? No, no, it's, it's just a slur. It's like calling somebody the N word in France. Ah, uh, so it in this case it was not. Uh, it was simply to say that he found them despicable. Yes. Huh. 
And it is interesting for such a progressive fighter for human and workers' rights to use such a despicable slur. Um, I don't think that those Marxist historians um, like to read or have this talked about. Um, another quote, universal suffrage as the basis of our constitution is the ideal of outrageous ignorance. Paris will forever be crushed by the stupidity of the masses. These peasants have, with their vote, dismembered the fatherland and strangled the republic. So democracy. Uh, let's have a look. What did the peasants do? The peasants elected a 26% majority of monarchists. How could they? Those deplorables. Um, all righty. Let us uh, continue with another manifesto. We, are, we already saw those uh, red placards by the Central Committee. Now, this placard is by the Grand Orion of Paris, by the Grand Lodge of France. It's in blue. Blue is, of course, the color of Freemasonry. Um, Manifesto de la Franc-Masonnerie, Manifesto of Freemasonry, it's from the 8th of April. This manifesto calls for conciliation between the Republican government in Versailles and the Commune in Paris. The gist of it, uh, so, um, and this uh, placard um, is uh, approved by the directory of the Grand Orient of Paris, and it is signed by 13 venerable masters. The signatures are right here. Um, now, you shouldn't think that this was approved of by all the Freemasons, but by um, a great number of them in Paris. And they call for an end of fighting. They don't say what should happen, but they say, let's stop the fighting. This doesn't work out. Um, the, Freema the Freemasons try again. Um, so the image that you see here is from the London Illustrated News from the 13th of May, 1871. This is the when the newspaper was published. It is after the event. The event is on the 11th of April. Okay, so the Freemasons, they make a parade through the city. They come to the ramparts um, and then they approach the, a, a general of the French Republic and they say, hey, we are Freemasons. We want to go to Versailles. We want to negotiate with the government. And three of the Freemasons are led through. They go to Versailles. They talk to the government. And you see here in this um, London newspaper, you can clearly recognize that these are Freemasons. Uh, on the right-hand side, I've shown you this much bigger, and you see the sash. You see the, um, got to help me out here, the compass and square, the compass and square. These yes, and in, indeed you see it in uh, almost all of those members in that group, as well as the groups uh, on the left. So, y yeah, they're clearly all wearing their little rank sashes, mm -hmm. you know, if they're a journeyman or a master or whatever. Yeah. So, the Freemasons head to Versailles, where the Republican government sits. They are welcomed by Jules Simon. Jules Simon is the Minister of Education of the French government. Um, why are they received by the Minister of Education? Because he is a Freemason. Um, later, they have an audience with the president of the French Republic, Adolphe Thiers. Well, Adolphe Thiers says, 
hey, negotiation is a great idea. First, we need your unconditional surrender. Of course, this is not on the table. So um, the negotiations fail. Um, and now that this uh, attempt at conciliation has failed, um, the revolutionaries, the Paris Commune, um, they up the ante. Um, on the 26th of April, Jules Vallès, who is the editor-in-chief of the biggest newspaper at that time in Paris, and Emile François Kirifoc, uh, he's also a Freemason, they organize a meeting of Freemasons. And in this meeting, they say, hey, we have to take decisive action on the side of the Paris Commune. And this meeting decides the following notion. I quote, if no decision for establishing peace is, taking, is taken within 48 hours, Masonic flags will be planted on the ramparts. If only one flag is hit by a bullet, we will all take up arms to avenge this profanation. This literally means to enter the war on the side of the Paris Commune. On the same day, the 26th of April, a delegation of 2,000 Freemasons moves to the Hôtel de Ville, the government of the Commune in Paris. They are received by members of the Commune, who are Freemasons themselves, um, and everybody is very happy. Um, now I'm going to show you a, uh, the newspaper of Jules Vallès from the 29th of April. And this is a very small note on the upper right of the newspaper. Um, and here we have to decipher a little bit. This is a little bit like reading the Illuminati um, because uh, uh, these are uh, in French Freemasonry. When you cut a word short, you don't put one point. You put three points that form a triangle. This is something which only happens in Romantic Freemasonry. This doesn't happen in England, in Germany, and in the US. This is a way of uh, making a word short in Romantic Freemasonry, especially French Freemasonry. I'm going to uh, decipher this for you. S sorry, very quickly for um, for our ro Romantic. You mean uh, you mean uh, Romance uh, Masonry in Romance language countries? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so here it says Eau de Paris, Orion de Paris, the Grand Lodge of Paris, the Grand Orion. The 22nd of April, 1871. E point V point. I couldn't decipher that. I don't know what it means. If somebody in the chat knows. T point C point F point. Très cher frère. Very dear brothers. And here, V E N Tavernier. V E N point is venerable, venerable master. So this is the master of a lodge. This master of a Freemasonic lodge um, asked Jules Vallès, who is also a Freemason, hey, I want to publish a note in your newspaper. Yeah, sure, go ahead. All righty, let's read this note. I quote. You are invited together at 35 Rue Jean-Jacques Rousseau to accompany our banner, which, representing the brotherhood of the people, will, by its presence, protest against tyranny and assure the future of liberty to coming generations. So, so here, this venerable master invites the Freemasons to take side for the commune. And we see what happens on this very day right here. Again, if I, I just want to throw something sure. in since we moved past that uh, slide. 
that uh, use of the triple uh, triple dots um, is something that was carried over, doubtless intentionally and consciously, as a nod by uh, people like Crowley. So, for example, you'll see his Silver Star organization, his little occult club, um, the Astrum Argenteum. Uh, you'll very often see that referenced by Crowley in his documents as A with the triple dot and then A with the triple dot. So it's the AA for Astrum Argenteum. Uh, later on, uh, it has the implication, <clears throat> because they were all Western Kabbalists, um, of the supernal triad of uh, Keter, Hokma, and Bina, um, which are the, the top three uh, Sephirot, which are, you know, they're the the domains uh or thematic domains outside of um uh they're the supernal triad they're the top three so it's sort of prior to manifestation and if you want to understand the meaning of those three dots there's a there's a as interpreted later by people like crowley in this uh western kabbalistic uh context um, there is a thing that uh, Crowley put together called the Naples Arrangement, which is in some respects sort of like Crowley ripping off um, John Dee's uh, Monus Hieroglyphica. Um, but I just wanted to throw that in there as, you know, when we get later on in this series, as I hope we'll be able to, if Antaeus remains uh, good natured enough to continue making it go forward, um, I think we're going to see those three dots again. And it's worth calling out that they have something of a, of, of a history, and we can see it early here. I'm looking forward to get to Crowley. <clears throat> and now we've just seen that uh, the Venerable Master, Tavernier, invited the Freemasons to uh, join in marching to the ramparts and that's what the freemasons do on the 29th of april they march towards the ramparts and plant their banners and if the banners are hit by a bullet from the french republican forces then the freemasons will take up arms for the commune uh, this uh, print is from uh, le monde illustré a french newspaper uh from the 6th of may it's a little later but the event is from the 29th of april and later the um freemasons um under the direction of emile francois thierry Fock, will uh, ask the commune to set up a national guard composed solely of freemasons but the Paris Commune and the National Guard, they say, well, this is very nice, but you can continue working in our structures. Yeah, thank you. No, <laughs> that's funny and bold, yeah. man. Um, I've never, yeah, you were quite right about this being the Masonic Commune. This is a trip. It is. And we're nearing the end of this trip. Um, and uh, let's talk a little bit about the achievements of the Commune. Um, most of the achievements lie in the domain of vandalism. Um, so what we see here, uh, this is from the 11th of May. This is the demolition uh, of the house of Adolf Thiers. Adolf Thiers is the president <laughs> of the French Republic. <laughs> the day before, uh, Thiers had signed a peace treaty, the final pre peace treaty with Germany in Frankfurt. And uh, as a uh, punishment, the commune, because the house of Thiers is in Paris, they decide, okay, we're going to destroy your house. Uh, this is, I mean, uh, yeah, this is, uh, I don't know. Um, it seems to echo the same sorts of stuff we see now where they're, you know, will terrorize and hold individually accountable anyone who doesn't yeah. get into line, you know, like I, surrounding a Supreme Court justice's house. Yeah, I, I'm really waiting for um, the, I don't know, Congress to vote on the demolition of uh, Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> <laughs> it would, it, yes, it would certainly rhyme historically, right? 
and I would not be surprised by it. So let's uh, let's just wait and see. Uh, more vandalism. So the uh, Vendome column uh, was uh, erected under Napoleon the First to commemorate the victory against the Austrians. Um, they oh decide... wow! So that's the column outside my hotel in the Place Vendome. Ha! Huh. I've, I, I've been there. I've seen it. I did not realize that was its uh, point of origin. Shocking. Yes. So here they are dismantling it. Um, and uh, I'm just going to give you a rant from the Le Monde Illustré. So the print that you're looking at is from the French newspaper Le Monde Illustré, which is against the commune. The newspaper moved to Versailles. Uh, it is against the commune. I'm just going to give you this rant. It's, uh, uh, I'm going to paraphrase it. So they say, the column of the Roman emperor Trajan is still intact. Um, the, and the Germanic invaders did not destroy the column of this Roman emperor. And uh, later, the Vendome column was not destroyed after Napoleon was defeated. It was not destroyed by the Prussians. It was destroyed by the commune. And uh, they described this act as a les nation. Uh, I think in English also you have the term less majesty. And here they use the neologism uh, les nation. It is right, an so it's insult to the nation. An affront, yes. An, an, uh, uh, a punishable affront yes it is punishment is in the air it's going to come but, soon but forgive my ignorance in this case it's gross and uh ridiculous ignorance but uh i i thought i saw that column still out there which is why i brought up my my trip to paris was it restored or replaced or it was restored hmm. thank god it was Check it out. A German just said, "Thank God the Vendome column was replaced." See a little bit of uh, a little bit of Franco-German brotherhood going on in the house, right? I mean, I can appreciate uh, great art. Um, I would go. Check there. it out. Uh, Anteos is like, no, I wouldn't go so far as to uh, to signal any kind of Franco-German brotherhood. Nice. <laughs> we we needn't get into these <laughs> these personal matters. Please go on. Sorry. All righty, so here they tear it down, um, and that's it. Um, okay, let us talk about yet another achievement of the Paris Commune. Let us talk about the desecration of churches and the persecution of priests. Here again, Jules Vallès. Uh, we're going to take a look at his newspaper from the 10th of May. Um, the communards had found um, a uh, secret crypt uh, in a church at the church of uh, what is the name Saint Laurent, and this crypt contained fourteen skeletons. Why are there fourteen skeletons in that crypt? Um, I quote the cry of the people from Gilles Vallès. It is the unanimous opinion of all the medical doctors of each nation, France, England, and the US, that these are female bodies, the skeletons. Again, we have the experts, trust the experts. The unanimous opinion, France, England, and the US. How many English and American doctors are at the moment in France? Are they representative for all the doctors? Anyways, these are the experts. These are female skeletons. Now, Gilles Vallès presents the conspiracy theory that praying women were attacked from behind by priests who used chloroform to put them unconscious, drag them into the crypt, chain them to the wall, rape them, kill them, and let their bodies rot in this crypt. The rape of the nuns in Belgium, the explosion of the Maine and Havana Harbor, the yes. Polish radio station. And here we have the l'enfant, the infamy or whatever, you know, um, the, the priests chloroforming the women 
in order to rape and kill them. Lovely. I, I, I ask myself how degenerate, how vile, how false, how base, how low of a human being do you need to be to put such a horrific lie into the world? It is really telling of the Paris Commune, I believe. Um, now, the Paris Commune is a very... Uh, another achievement is a desacralization of churches, de desecration of churches. So here we have uh, two more images. Um, the first one, the one on the left, uh, this shows a women's club in the church of uh, Saint-Germain. Uh, you see that all the religious uh, objects are removed from the walls. Um, it is not a place of uh, prayer of the mass anymore, but it's a place where um, citizens can gather. The same is true for the right-hand painting, uh, for, for the right-hand print. I didn't uh, verify the accuracy of the event, but it seems that the newspaper uh, made allusion to an, in, an event where a, uh, how to speak, dispute, a discussion broke out that had to be quelled by the National Guards. Um, yes, so this is, uh, but I mean, of course, they raped nuns, so um, you can, of, uh, they, they raped um, uh, praying women, so of course you can desecrate those churches. Um, okay, so at this moment, um, the French forces, uh, the uh, forces of the French Republic, they invade Paris um, starting on the 21st of May. This is another um, painting of how Paris looked like during the so-called uh, Semaine Sanglante, the Bloody Week. Um, here we have uh, another achievement of the Paris Commune. The Paris Commune took uh, some hundred, some two, three, four hundred hostages. And when they realized that they could not win the fight, they... Uh, assassinated, they executed the hostages. Um, this was on the 26th of May. Um, the picture that you see, it's not an original picture. It was made later. It was staged to kind of uh, revive this moment. Um, it's not historically accurate. Um, but they killed all those defenseless hostages. Um, just as a uh, side note, on the 22nd of April, so uh, one month before, they burned the guillotine. We have abolished the death penalty. Okay, let us assassinate and let us execute 62 hostages who are defenseless one month later. Um, yeah, there you go, humanity. Mm. And uh, all those hostages that you see here that are being uh, executed, the Paris Commune offered to exchange them against one prisoner. Around one month before, the Paris Commune said to the French government, we are going to give you all our hostages, among them the Archbishop of Paris, in exchange for one person, for Auguste Blanqui. Auguste Blanqui, who is also a Freemason, I mentioned him earlier. He let the newspaper, the, um, the fatherland in danger. Karl Marx said that Auguste Blanqui was the person, was the leader that the commune lacked. And I think he had a case. Auguste Blanqui um, was in such a high esteem. He had risked his life several times. He spent 30 years of his life in prison. Um, I'm sure that Auguste Blanc, he could have been the leader of the Paris Commune. He could have been the person uh, under whom the communards could have gathered, could have put their differences because there were many aside. But it didn't happen because Adolf Thiers, whose private house was demolished by the commune, as president of the French Republic said, no, we are not going to negotiate with terrorists or with communists. Um, okay. So, um, during the Semaine Sanglante, the Bloody Week, 
the Kominas, they realize we won't win this battle. So um, if we cannot win, then let's take everything down. They set fire to the Hotel de Ville, to the city hall. Um, all the public documents of importance are destroyed. This breaks my heart as a historian. It was also a nice building. Um, the Tuileries Palace, the palace of the royal family, is burnt down, destroyed. Um, the Louvre, they set fire on the Louvre, but uh, the um, Republican military is able to extinguish the fire. They also set fire on the Church of Notre Dame, Cathedral of Notre, Notre Dame. What I've shown you here is a picture of uh, 2019, because the fire that the communards set to the uh, Cathedral of Notre Dame was extinguished. Thank God. Yeah, even um, even back then they could easily put the fire out because it's very difficult for all that wood to catch fire. Don't want to get involved in uh, quote unquote conspiracy theories, but yeah, that just history sure does seem to rhyme, doesn't it? Yeah, but I think it's interesting that um, something that could only be accomplished with mass immigration was tried uh, some odd hundred twenty years earlier by the glorious commune. Um, Alrighty, um, and then finally, we are where we started off. We are at the wall of the Federates, where the last um, fighters of the Paris Commune were rounded up and executed. Um, the 28th of May, this marks the end of the Paris Commune. It brings us back to um, the Grand Orient, which to this day, on the 1st of May, commemorates the Paris Commune in the cemetery Père Lachaise, where the last fighters of the Paris Commune were executed. And that is it. The only thing I would think of uh, to say here, other than thank you very, very much indeed, and th th this is very, very interesting, uh, is that it uh, does seem that they... Uh, they certainly think of it as having been a good thing. Um, and they want to talk about the uh, bloodshed when the French forces retook the city, which certainly seems to have been considerable uh, in the thousands. You know, these days they'll like to talk about how, you know, only 60 some people were executed, but, uh, but uh, whereas the French state killed so, so many. Um, but obviously the, the people were executed first and uh the destruction of the city was enormous in terms of its uh, historical um uh you know sites and monuments and the rest and the other issue is that they barricaded themselves in such a fashion that the uh the the attacking forces had to be quite hardcore to get through uh if i remember correctly and and i perhaps I'm screwing something up. I probably am since this isn't my area of knowledge, but uh, I believe that the troops had to end up uh, not going for the barricades, but they simply blew their way into the buildings on either side and uh, went around them. And then they pretty much executed anyone who was calling someone else a citizen or had the the particular dialects that you might've heard in some of the uh, arrondissements that were... Um, that were known for supporting the, uh, the communards. Yeah. But, um, I have to say that, uh, once they did that, it seems they didn't have so many problems with, uh, with communes for quite some time. I mean, when was the, uh, when was the next one? The 1960s, wasn't it? 1960s, but that was, uh, I don't know, more of a, um, how to say, a march through the institutions, right. metapolitical successes that transformed yeah. into political ones. Yes, um, as, as they moved through with the, uh, the, the sort of metapolitical program that you referenced earlier on that the conservatives tried to put in place. So, yeah, and post-Gramsci, post of course. 
Yeah, and um, the, there remains only one question for me because we've established beyond doubt that the Freemasons were instrumental in bringing about the Paris Commune. But the thing is that I'm asking myself, um, is it Freemasonry that brought about the revolution? Um, or is Freemasonry just a vessel, an organizational structure that brings people together that can lead to revolution? Or is there something in Freemasonry that uh, necessarily leads to revolution? This is a, I, I think, a final question of interpretation, which is maybe um, much more, it's, it's a harder nut to crack than uh, whether the Freemasons carried out this revolution, which they did. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just say this. Um, we see a clear and, to me, entirely consistent uh, pattern uh, across more recent European history of utopians who organize in secret societies, as you've uncovered quite nicely in what, six, seven episodes now. Um, and utopianism requires first that everything be destroyed. We see that uh, for the most part, one of the exceptions being the uh, American Revolution, where they very quickly it was fairly conservative and they reinstituted in slightly modified form, you know, basic British government, you know, instead of parliament, they have Congress, you know, instead of a, a king, they have an elected president, but with strong executive power, um, they keep English common law, you know, so that was one of the exceptions in terms of the total amount of destruction. But time and time again, we see not only that the utopians have to destroy things before their phase of rebuilding them and i think we see that very much in implicit in the expression build back better as i'm hammering constantly on twitter you can't build back better unless everything's been destroyed mm -hmm. but i would add further that we see them always choosing moments of great crisis and terror when emotions are high and the herd can be expected to run first one way and then another it's that image I always reference because it's so strong in my mind from uh, the first book of the Commedia, you know, the Inferno by uh, Dante, where he's in the vestibule of hell. And as the people are preparing to, in their vast numbers, by the way, are preparing to cross the river into the underworld, there are huge crowds of them running first one way and then the other, and they're chasing banners and they're being stung by insects and wasps. So they're goaded and stung to chase these banners around. And this is, of course, quite literally in the case of the, the allegory Dante puts forth, the, the road to hell. So I don't know whether we can say yet, though the case can be made um, as a possibility, I don't know that we can say yet that they completely did it. But we know that you can't rebuild society unless you've destroyed what's there. And, you know, that would seem to cul culminate in things like, you know, critical theory, um, deconstruction, all these terms that we see come out of continental philosophy. And these are, for the most part, continental movements. You know, as you said before, it would probably be wise to take a look at how things were remade in Britain as a part of this story. Um, I simply don't know anywhere near enough to even hazard that to attempt it. Um, but yeah, uh, consistently we see utopians want to destroy everything first um, in order to realize their social engineering projects. And uh, not just that, but as I said, they tend to wait for inflection points in history. At least we can retrospectively construe them this way, where the crisis and the destruction is sufficient to remake. I mean, take a look at what happened after World War I with the fall of the great houses and the imperial structures, you know, from, from the Ottomans to the Habsburgs uh, and, and beyond. Uh, take a look at what happened after uh, World War II and the great influx of the Paz after, you know, places like Dresden were burned to the ground and, you know, the, the bombing and the warfare and the absolute, you know, destruction that was wrought. So I don't know if we could say it for sure, but 
I don't know. I'm not a betting man, but I would probably put my money on the idea that they were not simply um, that if they were just an organization for it, they were a primary one um, and that they were flooded with people who wanted to do this and backed by others still more powerful who wanted to do these things. But I tend to think it's it's a direct connection. I don't know. Have you formed any opinion? Um, you mentioned uh, two points here. Um, first, direct uh, destruction through revolution. Um, and then the, I think, uh, more creeping process of uh, reprogramming uh, of the cultural values, what we're seeing today. Um, and if we look back to how Freemasonry operated as a revolutionary force, we see that there might be a strong difference in how it plays out in uh, Romanic countries and Anglo-Saxon and Germanic countries. Um, <clears throat> if we look at South America, there's a constant struggle between Catholic so um, conservative Catholic uh, forces and Freemasonic so uh, forces. Um, in Italy, the unification against the Vatican was pushed by Freemasons. Uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi, one example, where great parts of the uh, church state were destroyed. It was cut back a lot. Um, in France, we have seen it throughout history, uh, 1789, 1830, 1884, 1870, 1871 with the commune, a lot of destruction, a lot of explosion. Um, you mentioned the example of the American Revolution, which was more gentlemanish, uh, if you will, although some people were teared and feathered and uh, hung from and, trees. And, and ridden out of a town on a rail. And yes, people could certainly argue, as so many continental Europeans do, that that has not uh, mitigated the late uh, imperial pause coming out of the US at this point. But sorry, go on. And uh, if I look, for instance, at Germany, here we see that uh, Freemasonry is involved in revolutionary movements. For instance, 1848. Um, but the thing is that they don't succeed. There is something in the German culture, the German genes, the um, uh, Anglo-Saxon culture, the Anglo-Saxon genes that makes Freemasonry a less political organization. And in, um, in Germany today, uh, Freemasonry is outlawed, is it not? I mean, you literally <laughs> couldn't have Freemasons appearing and celebrating wearing their sashes and things. Uh, um, uh, in the city where I live, there is a great lodge. Um, it's not outlawed. It was outlawed in uh, a the, certain the, period the, of German mid, history. Mid-century Germans, but not since, I thought. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, oh, no, well. it's, totally, it's totally legal today. Um, the, the thing is just that um, Freemasonry in Germany, I don't think it plays such a big role. Mm. And um, now to what you mentioned after, um, the reshaping of society that we see today, which does not work through violence, through force primarily, but it works um, through education, through movies, um, music. Um, if you look at Hollywood movies, the allusions to, free, to Freemasonry are abundant. Why are they? Or, or why would anybody care? If you listen to, uh, I don't know, music videos of Michael Jackson, it's full of uh, Masonic imagery. Uh, why would that be the case? What do they want to tell us? Um, I think it's very hard. It's very hard to pin down what is really going on. Is Freemasonry still a, a revolutionary subversive force? Um, with what goal? Who pulls the strings? Um, from a historical perspective, I can tell you, sure, let's look at that revolution. Uh, let me look at the documents and then I can tell you. But today it's very, very problematic. Um, do you have any idea how we, we could shed light on that, on temporary his, contemporary history? Uh, I can only speak and uh, to a very, very limited extent about the Masons today um, and only uh, in the United States. Um, 
so yeah um m- my grandfather was uh was a 33rd degree mason um i've still got his fez um and you know i believe he was probably peripherally former mafia in chicago you know coming up in the 20s and 30s 40s um it and and from what i've seen you know of people uh, you know who who are lawyers or prosecutors or police officers who might have like a little masonic emblem on the back of their car um you know from my l- very limited interactions with masons in the united states it seems to be uh, a good old boy club a backroom network um and that it probably wields a, still a fair amount of influence at the level of local uh, politics in terms of being able to get some support and have a, a place or a network to get things done behind the scenes. Um, in the United States, I don't feel that they're, that they wield any particularly, well, any real, uh, political power at scale. Um, and the only reason that I could put forth for that is because they're certainly not being prevented from doing so it's it would probably be that they don't they don't need it they don't require it i mean the government was set up by masons once upon a time and the uh, most of the ideals that they were that they claimed to have been going for back in the day um they're realized in the american framework so yeah i don't I, I, I'm sorry to say, you know, there. I don't know much about it. There are certainly people who are much more into that. Um, I think Jay Dyer comes to mind, you know, for the contemporary role of Masons. I just, I, I don't know enough about it to say any more than that. But that's my best guess. Um, okay, let me try to share the screen again. Uh, um, let me see. Here we go. Okay. Um, so this is the IRS building, um, and here we have a, we, the people, and on top of the pyramid is a white part. Um, so uh, th- this is inside of the, no, uh, let me see. This is, uh, the, yeah, the headquarters of the, uh, IRS here. We have the white and the black, uh, this is, a uh, reminiscent to the floor uh, in Masonic lodges. And then at the entrance, um, you have the two columns. Um, yeah. So ju- ju- just from looking at that, so I, I don't know when the headquarters of the IRS was built, but just from looking at that, it seems to me that uh, Masonic imagery is very present. And uh, could there be um, a bigger power of a state than to demand taxes? And why put Masonic imagery there? So I don't know. Um, but this is for me something I, you, you know, I don't want to wait 50 years so that I can go to the archives to research that. I want to know it now. But this is a problem of history. No. Yes. Well, see, you're young enough that maybe you could just squeak by and wait 50 years to find out more about it. Sadly, I won't be around for that, or it's highly, highly unlikely. Um, I will say this, there's a lot more going on with some of the, the the masonry and the lodges in Northern Virginia and around D.C. Um, you know, I've gone ape shit in the past where I'm like, you know, if you thought about the Pentagon as the center of a pentagram, and you drew the lines out to the tips of the points of the star that the Pentagon would be a part of what would be in those specific locations on the map, you know, but I never, I never dug into it to go find out more. But, uh, you know, for example, my, my old buddy, uh, Jolly Scholar 888 took me to, I think it was in Alexandria. There's a crazy, crazy, uh, Masonic temple there. It might be in DC can't remember yeah it's probably there's probably uh, certainly there's going to be a temple in both places but i can't remember which one was the most wild and uh and egyptian but there is more of that kind of symbolism that you're talking about i myself was not aware of the business with the irs building which is kind of creepy um also the uh the you know the capstone the idea of reason um i could see where they might go with the pyramid it's on the money after all and that's their job but they've got that 
that shuffled together single column that seems to uh, to integrate both the black and the white column, the columns of uh, Yo Joachim and Boaz or whatever, you know, the black and white ones, they seem to have stuck them together, which is kind of a weird development from that symbolism. Um, so yeah, who knows, uh, who knows what's, um, who knows what's going on with all of that. I have certainly seen enough in the course of our research all the way back to, you know, platonic ideas being brought over, you know, by Gemistus Plethon, you know, from those early days when we started looking at this in the course of this series, which has been going on for a year or two now, more power to you, Antaeus. Um, I have certainly seen enough to um, to be agnostic about it. Like at this point, if we found out that there was an inner order Masonic organization that was like uh, a, a, an upper tier that arranged for the great global pause, I would be like, yeah, okay, not surprised. I'd, I'd, I'd believe it, you know, um, presented with, uh, with enough evidence. And there's certainly no absence of, uh, evidence that seems to point that way. So yeah, I'd have to, uh, I'd have to hold off until I heard more from people who are knowledgeable about contemporary Freemasonry, because I'm just, I'm too ignorant of it. At this moment, uh, nothing would shock me. I have to say, um, how are we going to shock the audience with the seventh episode? I think um, we're heading for Germany. Really? <clears throat> yes. I remember we uh, agreed on the Tula Society. <laughs> nice. I think there's going to be a lot of lot of people watching for that one. Yeah. Yeah, Tula Society and uh, and the uh, Hausmarken and the uh, Folkish societies of the 1920s and and journals like uh, Odal and uh, Heimdall. Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, this is going to be interesting. And of course, we're going to deal with the Sodoms Efflinge. This is difficult to translate. These are the Aplings of Sodom. <laughs> this is a this is crazy shit. Uh, this was one of the leading uh, Ariosofs uh, who made the theory that uh, back in antiquity, man would intermingle with apes and that led to a cursed race. Um, we're going to talk about all of it. Wow. Aplings of Sodom. That Sodom's might... That, that might... That might have to be the episode title because that's going to be a pull, man. Even Academic Agent will come watch for that one. If if we title it Aplings of Sodom, it's going to be standing room only. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Okay, so that would put us in Germany in World War One. Indeed. Um, and, and of course, the period preceding that, um, because a lot of these folkish movements, I mean, you could argue they started as early as things like, you know, Wagner. Um then we've got uh, perhaps the um, the extension of that to some extent because uh, you've got um, you've got uh, Theodor Reuss Reuss I don't know how do you pronounce in German R E U S S Reuss Reuss yes um, and uh, the the Ordo Templi Orientis and what seemed to be a number of clear indicators that they uh, were overlapping with uh, secret services. Um, and I, I think with the the shift into the 20th century, we're going to be in a much better position to um, to to nail down some clear documented associations between some of these major occult figures um, and uh, secret services. You know, I think we, the argument can be made with uh, Royce um, and uh, it certainly can a strong argument and case can be made for uh, Crowley uh, having been explicitly uh, 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 Secret Service's operative with plausible deniability to some extent of the uh, of the crown. So yeah, that will bring us into World War One. And would you think that would be where we end, or do you think it's worth uh, rolling forward into uh, World War Two at some point? 
that episode uh, that series uh, was so much fun to me i learned so much and i would be totally open to go for a, for an eighth episode well then yeah we'll just have to see it sounds like that eighth episode might be a good point for us uh to stop if we can get to it because there's so many other people uh covering conspiracies that come afterwards even with uh world war ii there are plenty of people who have you know plowed back and forth across that um historiography um however i think for us it would be valuable because it's going to link to a bunch of themes that we saw with world war one um or we'll see uh shortly with world war one um you've got people like crowley you know heading over to the the, the creating his abbe uh a abbey of thelema in um in italy under uh, uh, uh under mussolini and so you know from world war one with crowley we can track him into the interwar period um and we can even see a little bit of him uh in the period as we start to deal with uh world war ii and also last point i think we're gonna see um i don't know i think it would be valuable for us to at least go that far because though other people have looked at that period i don't know anyone who has done it as a culmination of a review that goes all the way back to the Florentine Neoplatonists. I think we are the first. Yes. Pioneers of some kind are the first ones who might live through it. <laughs> Aplings. Oh, yes. Aplings of Sodom. Man. <laughs> yeah, that, that's something to look forward to. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, 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 again, thank you very, very much. Is there anything uh, that you wanted to cover or shill before we wrap up? Uh, I don't have anything else to say um, apart from thank you for having me on. Um, I learned quite a lot. It was astonishing. It was astounding what I learned. Um, and the fact that we hash this out together that you nudged me in the right direction and said this is how we have to organize it thank you very much i'm looking forward to the next session and um that's it excellent well for my part i will shill you please follow anteas anteas over on uh odyssey and please follow him on uh twitter i think i have the odyssey link below i'm not sure i have the twitter one i will put that in there and just so you know i still have not received the uh bibliography if um if you're able to um maybe try resending it through email check that address because it hasn't come for me uh but if for any reason that doesn't work maybe uh sling it to me through uh a dm or something and i'll get it plugged in there because i know people are going to want to be able to take a look at the uh bibliographic information for the series so please ladies and gentlemen do follow anteos uh and uh if you want, as we close here, if you appreciate it, maybe throw a, a capital A in the chat to thank him for his efforts. Um, we'll be back with the next episode uh, just as soon as he has completed the necessary research. Um, and we certainly won't rush him on that. Um, so, yeah, thanks again, uh, Mr. Anteos. And thanks to everyone for watching this, um, our most recent uh, episode of the light in darkness series there will be at least two more coming up so don't miss those until next time uh i am semi and uh i am out <laughs>